The APSA Cape Epic is an event of enormous proportions and a benchmark for world mountain biking. The eight-day journey through South Africa's Western Cape is a test of skill, fitness, partnership and equipment and over the years has become a rite of passage for mountain bikers the world over. With 107 kilometres and 2,800 metres of climbing, Stage 3 is one of the most challenging of this year's race. After the hotspot in the summit of Nuverberg, the highest point of the route, the iconic Grunlandberg, awaits the riders. A white-knuckle descent leads them into the Land Rover technical terrain before the Lebanon trails take them back to Oak Valley. On the start line at Oak Valley Estate, the wearers of the yellow zebra jersey, Nino Scherter and Lars Forster, with their closest rivals Manuel Fumic and Henri Gavancini right next to them. As the starter's gun fires, the big question was, could the chasing Cannondale team inflict damage on the race leaders? In the women's category, Denmark's Anneke Langfell and Anna van der Breggen of the Netherlands started the day in the orange leader jerseys. Leaving the Oak Valley estate, their biggest rivals, Ariane Luti and Maya Wostowska, had only one goal, to claw back as much time as possible. In the men's race, the lead group was strung out after the first 10 kilometres and the cross racing team with Guterres and Chink led Canada Factory Racing, Scott and Centurion Voda on the Nuverberg climb. Chink and Guterres put the hammer down and were the first team through the Dimension Data hotspot at the summit of Nuverberg. On the fast fire road descent, Fumich caught up with the leaders and soon a big lead group with Canada, Scott, Bulls Heroes and Trek Sellers and Marco were together at the front. Those four teams pulled away, stringing out the rest of the field as they advanced towards the iconic Grunlandberg climb. On the lower slopes of the ascent, the Bulls heroes Urs Hooper and Simon Stibjan took up the pacemaking with a handful of the top teams right behind them. Approaching the summit of Grunlandberg, Canada's Aventini moved to the front, but the rest of the teams were in striking distance. The leaders flew down the treacherous Grunlandberg descent. The recent fires on the mountain made the track very susceptible to erosion and the teams had to avoid washed out gullies and loose rocks, but the pace of the front was frantic. At the start of the neck climb, Canada Factory Racing took the lead with Schurter and Forster a few bike lengths back. But then disaster struck for the leaders in the yellow jerseys. Lars Forster had a rear wheel puncture. Descending down the neck, Fumic and Avancini were on their own, chased by the Bulls heroes Simon Stibjan and Urs Huber. Schurter and Foster struggled to fix their puncture and decided to descend for almost five kilometers on the rim, a mechanical that has thrown the race wide open. Finally, the backup team reached the yellow jersey leaders and honored a toy gave Foster a wheel. Scott's Ram then set off more than nine minutes behind Fumich and Avancini. Charging through the switchbacks above Hohook, Fumik and Avancini didn't hold back and took firm control of the race. They reached water point two at Hohook Inn around a minute and a half before the two chasing teams, Bulls Heroes and Trek Salas and Marco. Going up the South Hill climb, Avancini and Fumich maintained their rhythm and led the lonely chasers, Bulls Heroes, by a minute and a half. Further back in the field, Nino Schurter took charge of the chase group. He pulled his partner Forster along, constantly reducing the gap to the leaders. Entering the initially rocky but always thrilling Lebanon trails, Fumich and Avancini powered towards their first stage win. After a strong performance and some luck on their side, they won in 4 hours and 30 minutes, 2 minutes and 24 seconds of Uber and Stibjan. Third were Trek Salas and Marcos, Ferrara and Poro, and after an impressive fight back, Schurter and Forster crossed the finish line in fourth, six minutes and 45 seconds behind Fumich and Avancini, who are the new wearers of the yellow zebra jersey. In the women's race, the top team stayed together on the early phase of the stage, but on the approach to the Nuverberg climb, race leaders Annika Langval and Anna van der Breggen stepped up a gear and claimed the dimension data hotspot. The four-time Absecape Epic winner and a newbie partner for Bregan, the World Road Race Champion, once again controlled the race and won their fourth consecutive stage, almost six minutes ahead of Candice Lille of South Africa and Germany's Adelaide Morath. In the GC, Langfell and Van Bregan now lead by 23 minutes and 43 seconds. And after three stages of this year's Absa Cape Epic, this is how the uh, general classification now looks. New leaders in uh, Manuel Fumich and Ulrich Avancini.
for Cannondale Factory Racing after the drama on stage three. They saw Scherter and Forster lose six minutes and 45. They're now 2.41 down. Uba and Steve John in third. Hathleen Beers, the best performing of the African teams. And this is the result of uh, stage three. So uh, Uber and Steve John finishing second there for Aaron Poro in third place. Shirt and Forster managing their uh, losses as best they could. They made up about uh, two and a half of those nine minutes they lost and uh, finishing in fourth place. Athlean Beer, seventh of the leading Apps African team, and Heineken Fagard continue a very consistent week. Pat and Lakata, 10 minutes and 22 down. And this is the results of the women's race yesterday. Another utterly dominant, perf dominant performance by Anna Galangvill and Anna van der Bregen of Investex Ongo Specialized. They added five minutes and 51 seconds to their lead, but a change behind them. Wojtowska and Luti losing copious amounts of time due to a puncture and a somewhat uh, comedic uh, situation at the water point that saw them use a wheel that had already been replaced. And of course, they dominate the race. Hello, welcome to our coverage of day five, stage four of the Absa Cape Epic here at Oak Valley. It's an earlier start, uh, as you probably noticed, because you're with us now. And it is cool, it is chilly, but a beautiful morning has dawned here. Robbie McEwen's alongside me here. Morning, Robbie, and to Neil Gardner. Good morning, good early morning. Yeah, early morning uh, for everyone out here. Nice and cool uh, for the riders. And we've got the elite riders heading off uh, very early in, this cool in the cool conditions. They quite enjoy that? Uh, they will enjoy the cool conditions, but there were a few saying yesterday was a little bit too cool at the top of the Grunlandberg. There was quite a lot of rain and they said it was not cool. They said it was freezing cold <laughs> and uh, it made the day quite difficult. But uh, this morning we've got a, a beautiful day that's dawned, clear blue skies and it looks like the temperatures are going to get into the low 20s. So ideal racing conditions today. Neil Gardner, yesterday we saw the drama at the puncture and the time lost. It does set up this race magnificently for a mid-race time trial. 2.41 down, the world champion in the cross country chasing the world marathon champion. It's got all the ingredients for, for a great day. We couldn't ask for anything better. Obviously, the riders aren't very happy about puncturing, and uh, we always say anything can happen at the Absa Cape Epic, and it does. And it uh, looks like it's Scott Sram have had their bad luck. Let's see if uh, Cannondale Factory Racing have their day and when that day happens to be. Quite a technical day today, uh, quite a lot of single track. Uh, you've rid ridden a little bit of the course yesterday. Um, it, it's a day that often we say it suits the cross country races. Yeah, it is a technical day, but uh, some really steep climbs, but it's really nice manicured tracks for the most part. They don't get that typical rough, epic course to negotiate here around Oak Valley. Start and finish in the same place, of course, and it's uh, a nice big open, well, it's sort of a figure of eight with one big opening loop, Neil. Well, this is the kind of route that you do if you're out and coming out for a nice leisurely ride. It's a perfect distance, 40 k's, and a really amazing mix of single track, a little bit of respite in some of the small sections of, uh, of farm road but on the whole just a really rewarding and exciting piece of trail to ride and uh, of course the top professionals are going to be uh, not here for fun they're here to do business and they're fascinated to see exactly how these top guys roll out the red carpet as they say they've got a time trial it's a measured effort they've got to be careful not to blow up too early on those steep climbs well the first part of the course is a bit more rolling it's more mm. open and long gradual climbs the second part of the course a lot more technical the climbs are sharper and then a lot of climbs with hairpin turns and but you get those really nice tracks some beautiful downhills through the forested areas and uh, i think the most beautiful part of the course is up around the the Grunland falls and you go climb up to one side and then you descend a little bit, cross over the, the creek and then back up the other side, up the steps. And uh, the run down to the finish, just magnificent down those, those shaded trails through the forest, really flowing and in and out through the trees. And, uh, but you're gonna have to really concentrate too because it's quite downhill, the speeds will be high, can't afford to make any mistakes and it's gonna be a really high intensity stage. The uh, Land Rover Technical Terrain uh, section called uh, Fissy's Magic, uh, a tribute to uh, Peter Fisser, who is the uh, original uh, course uh, builder in these parts. And of course, there are lots of snakes out on the course today. Cobra, Mamba, uh, Boomslung, Pofara, they're all out there. These are little sections of the route that many people in this part of the world know very, very well. So let's uh, get to the riders today. Now, if uh, the pro riders lose a partner and the other rider decides to ride on his own, he becomes a leopard. It used to be known as the outcast. They become the leopard now. And they are solitary riders. They're not allowed to ride uh, 
uh, not only influence the racing at all, but they can ride on. And yesterday, Sam Gay is abandoned uh, 100 metres after the start, leaving Yaroslav Kulhavi as a leopard. And I think there are five or six of them. So let's hear from a few of them. Yeah, it's new because uh, Perios Epics uh, we did very well. And uh, yeah, uh, there's this spot and there's the Epic. And uh, uh, that's, I mean, I mean, it's normal. A lot of, a lot of uh, teams. Uh, Every time, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's okay. I'm not sure what's the plan, but uh, I hope I will enjoy uh, the the time trial and uh, maybe tomorrow stage to Stellenbosch, and then uh, I will see what what will be what will be best for me. Uh, if if it's uh, better training or or uh, next stages, so yeah, I will see. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe uh, new new experience and uh, yeah, that's my first first outcast jersey. So yeah, uh, I'm uh, I'm looking forward for other guys. We are we are four, I think. So yeah, new experience and uh, I'm looking forward a little bit. Yeah, we've had quite a sad day yesterday. Uh, Tristan, my partner. Um, had um, had problems with his health and um, yeah had to pull out the race. Uh, we decided together that it's the best for his health and yeah now I'm by myself as a lonely leopard trying to finish the race. Yeah, it's uh, uh, my motivation this morning is that uh, I just want to arrive in Val de Vie, finish the race, and yeah give it today, give it my best shot, try to make the best out of it. Yaroslav Kulhavi, a couple of the uh, leopards, Andrew Dubenach, uh, Matthew Zulman, uh, among them Jan Shah, also to, uh, Tim Hammond missing out on, on, on a ride today. It's a cool initiative just to keep those riders in and they get a really cool shirt as well, the, the leopard jersey. Yeah, it, it is a great initiative, uh, you know, just because one goes out, you shouldn't kick out the whole team, so uh, it's good to keep them in the race. Absolutely. Right. So there are riders, of course, riding as teams. Let's go down to the uh, start and hear from Lara Messiger, who's got a couple of those riders with him. Okay. Alan, what's in the menu for today? It's a time trial today and um, it will be quite a short day but um, still it will be intense and um, we try to find a good rhythm today and um, not doing overpacing it for the next um, three days coming. Um, we now are more looking for supporting our our mates. Um, we'll see how the days goes but so far it's pretty cold out there so we have to get warm first. <laughs> Thank you, good luck. Thank Thanks. Back to the studio now. Thanks very much, uh, Laura, hearing from the Bulls. It's not really their type of day today. It's a marathon day. They know they, they're going to be under the pump today, Neil. I think it really will uh, play a role today because we saw all those switchbacks, all those corners. There's probably as many corners as there are in this 40K circuit as there were yesterday uh, over the 100Ks. And it's about it, how you enter and exit the corner and just uh, half a second a corner uh, could cost them a bit of time. And uh, the cross-country experts, Manuel Fumich, Nino Schurte, and the likes are going to have a bit of an advantage today. Well, we know Nino uh, and Lars Forster are going to have to take some risks and give it absolutely everything because they lost a chunk of time yesterday and they will just, that'll be burning. They <laughs> really want to take back as much as possible and uh, they are going to be going with absolutely everything they have and, and risk blowing up because they're just so angry deep down at what happened yesterday. They played it cool in the interviews. Yeah. But they're it's always a sign. The sign that they play, if Nino's playing it really cool, it means that uh, something's a little bit under his skin and he needs, uh, needs to prove a point today. Very excited to see how he handles today and how Lars, in fact, uh, handles the pressure. It's going to be a big day for him. Yeah, I mean, I think that is one of the things that we perhaps lost in, in amongst uh, the yesterday's drama, the puncture, was that Lars, uh, just before then, was suffering a little as he as he uh, was trying to hang on to that group uh, going up Grunenberg. And that's the moment you do start to make small mistakes, not see the, the really the right line and, and have a mechanical like he did that flat tie. Now I did a little bit of research into this yesterday. I, I went around, I asked some questions, I looked at the equipment the teams were using. I had heard that the Scotch Ram guys were using a, a special, uh, specially made pro only 
170 TPI tyre. Now that's the thread count in the yeah. sidewall of the tyre. The higher the count, the less rubber, the more cotton. The more cotton, the lighter it is, so they go for performance. Now I looked at some other teams, guys like Hermida, Purito Rodriguez, a lot of others, riding 120 TPI, so a lot more rubber in their sidewalls, a lot more resilient. And I confirmed with Scott Sram, they said, yeah, they're riding 170s. Mm -hmm. So there's the big risk of uh, getting a cut. He had a huge cut in the, in the sidewall, but we also we saw him, he couldn't get the tire off the rim. He was ro riding with the foam insert, so the basically the ride flat um, setup, and that's why they couldn't get the tire off. It cost them a whole lot of time. So it seems it was not the best tire choice, but these guys, they like to go on what they feel is right for themselves. Absolutely, and, and this is, is also, aside from, from what is right for the racing, this is one of the great testing grounds for all these uh, manufacturers, for all the brands to bring their, their product. It's the toughest mountain bike stage race in the world. It's the biggest uh, uh, platform for them. So they bring a product out here to test, and it's that fine line between saying, listen, this is what I want to ride. You guys must ride this or try that. No, this is what I want to stay with. This is what I feel is going to suit me. So it's getting that balance right between the, the rider's desires, the brands and the manufacturers, and the products uh, are trying to test product. It's, it's a fascinating balancing act. Let's go back down to Laura at the start. Well, these guys are getting pretty consistent over the last few days of racing. Constantly inside the team pretty much every single day, facing themselves on this event. Into ourselves in this prologue or TT, and um, yeah, we, we'll see how it goes. But I have a great team, and they really helped me, the medical people as well. So, very fortunate for that, and they've done everything they can, and now it's up to me. Is it good to have this short stage at least? Um, I don't really know because it's, it's probably harder. <laughs> But yeah, it will. Your recovery is a little bit better. You're only racing an hour or two, um, opposed to four. So yeah, it will be. It'll be quite nice. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Let's see how it goes for these guys. We're back to the studio now. Matt Beers had a bad fall yesterday. Um, a very freakish thing. A bike in front of him kicked up a, a stone, and it uh, hit his tire. Down he went, he punctured, down he went, and uh, got some nice, nasty gashes on his thigh, and, uh, and his, you can see his arms uh, wrapped up there as well. Well, we've seen our fair share of blood on the, on the trails uh, over the past uh, 15 years, and uh, it was uh, certainly a glory scene, seeing those shorts completely ripped up, and uh, Matt Beer's looking a little distressed, but taking him his stride, he's a professional mountain biker, he's there in the business of denying pain, and uh, get fixed up, get back on the bike. It really depends on uh, how he slept last night. If you've got cuts all down one side, you've really got only one side to sleep on, and that can affect your recovery uh, going into the next uh, next few days. But he made re reference there to the to the brevity of today's stage, the relative brevity of today's. Yes, it'll be an intense day. So if he hasn't had the best of nights, at least he's not going to be out there uh, all day. He's got a full day almost to recover once they finish. There's Matt Beers on the left, Alan Hathley on the right, the South African champion, and the under-23 world champion. So we've got both the under-23 world champion and the under-23 world cup champion racing in this race. Hathley's the, the world champion. And Peter Fogerhard, the, the young Norwegian riding with Christian Heineck, is the world cup champion, won three rounds of the world cup, including in Stellenbosch in March last year, round one of the world cup. Well, Hathley and uh, Matthew, Matthew Beers have got a, a healthy lead in the Absa African men's jersey. They have uh, 41 seconds over Marco Jubera and Nico Carstens. So a comfortable margin, they can afford to take it a bit easier today. 41 minutes? Sorry, 41 minutes. Yeah, it would have been a bit nervous with 41 seconds, I think. As Matt Beers and Alan Hathley are about to roll down the start ramp. And... Uh, well, we've got Laura standing by for another interview. Let's uh, hear who she's got. And the clock is now ticking towards those final 30 seconds. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, how is it going? How is it going to be the day today? Yeah, good morning. It's probably going to be hard. Start to feel like we have done a couple of stages and yeah, just get going. I think it's going to be a good day. How's been going this uh, first part of the race so far? First stage was really hard. I had to surf a lot and uh, after three hours I was kaput, but then it's 
it's better and better, so yeah, I think it's gonna be nice. Do you expect a good result for today? Yeah, hopefully. We, yeah, we'll just keep a steady pace and do our best and uh, yeah, full gas and hopefully it's enough for a good result. Thank you, good luck. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> we are back to the studio now. Christian Heineck are waiting to load. They're just, I think, behind. There they are, behind Alan Hathley and Matt Beers. This, this day really does suit this pair. Remember how well they were going in the prologue on uh, Table Mountain before they had that unfortunate puncture within the last couple of kilometers on uh, uh, Beers' bike? To correct myself, they have a 23-minute lead over Mbuko Giant. Uh, it is comfortable. They will be able to afford a little bit of uh, an easy day, to, easier day today. Um, that uh, recovery, very important for Matt Beers. Certainly had a bit of a blood on him yesterday and uh, will affect his sleep, as we said. Just want to hopefully just take today in its stride and survive another day because stage stage five is a big day, Gerald. Absolutely. It's the Queen stage tomorrow as we head to Stellenbosch. It's three-minute intervals between the starters now. And uh, so a bit of time between them and the speeds that these guys go, it's incredible. Fargo Hart and Christian Heineck then will leave in just under three minutes time. And then it's Jochen Kess and Daniel Gassmeyer behind uh, after them. Damiana Ferrara, Samueli Poro, Urs Huber, Simon Stevejan, Nina Schurter, Lars Foster, and the yellow jerseys on the shoulders of Canada Factory Racing. Manny Funimich and Enrique Avicini, they will leave uh, last at 7.39 local time. 7.39.30, beg your pardon. Laura, let's go back down to the uh, start. Laura. Daniel, we've seen your team riding very strong today. What can we expect from you? Yeah, I think uh, we are feeling better from day to day, especially Jochen. And uh, he had some problems uh, the first and the second day. And yesterday it was uh, okay for us and we could also make some time again. And I think, um, yeah, it will be a good day for us again. And also to, to Stellenbosch, I think we can maybe gain some time again. And yeah, for sure, to the front guys, it will be hard to close up the gap. But uh, I think we can do a good result in the end. The Absa Cape Epic doesn't give a rest for the riders, right? Yeah, for sure. Also today, we have to wake up really early. And yeah, it's it, it's a tough race for sure. It's for, for sure the, the toughest one mountain bike race you can do in the world. Thank you. Good luck for today. Thank you. Gessmeyer and Jochen Kess with loads of experience there and uh, a team that have just kept themselves uh, in the frame. And this is uh, this combination is amazing because uh, on the left is a 38-year-old Christian Heineck, a former winner of this race. Uh, so calm and composed and uh, relaxed, and he's got this young man alongside him, a 21-year-old uh, firecracker, Peter Fagard, uh, who's a cross-country uh, sensation. 16 years age difference between them, that's the, that's the age of the race. So a significant uh, gap there, but it looks like there's some good dynamics there. And Christian Heineck, uh, his future career is in developing cycling and uh, doing it at right at the highest level of the sport here. Christian Heineck, a former winner of the race. He came in as a rookie, rode with Robert Menon and uh, won the race. Dramatic race that was. We saw some uh, major mechanicals from his side. So he knows exactly how to manage disaster and he can pass on all that knowledge to his young teammate. Robert Menon, there's a name to conjure with, and the buck. He was the man who crashed into the buck. Away goes Peter Pogard and uh, his partner Christian Heineck there, 17 minutes and 41 seconds behind in sixth place on general classification as they head into the uh, time trial. It'll be a, an interesting battle this because Fagerhard is a, is a short race specialist. Uh, Heineck is not. So managing well, that's not a battle between these yeah, exactly. two because they're teammates, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it'll be an interesting combination to see how they, they manage the pacing of the time trial. Right, let's go down to Laura as uh, Gessma and Kess are on the start. They've got a couple of minutes to wait. Here's Laura. Samuel, good morning, buongiorno. Good morning. What do you expect for today's stage? Which are the key points of this time trial? Uh, yeah, well, we don't know because it's uh, really strange to have a team trial during a stage race. So we keep pushing uh, all out uh, for uh, all the day and uh, we will see it to the end. 
Do you think you can get a, a spot in the podium today? Uh, well, I, I don't think it's the, the right stage for do it because maybe a lot of uh, team have some rest yesterday, so we, we must push uh, a lot for the overall. Maybe today it's a little bit difficult. Thank you. Quite interesting, Buz. Uh, quite interesting because the Trek Seller San Marco uh, pair of uh, Samuel Poro and Damiano Ferraro in fourth place, but they're just 11 seconds behind third place, the, the Bulls. So that's, that's going to be a race there. Yeah, that, that will be a really good battle. It's interesting to, to hear them say, uh, on one side, tactically, well, let's just go all out and see where you come out at the end because it, it is relatively short compared to what they've been doing. Yeah. But uh, also that there's been some teams taking, well, uh, in inverted commas, day off, take going a little bit easier. And I'm just looking at the, the time at the first water point, and uh, Andre Sink and uh, Sergio Mantecon have the fastest time there by over two and a half minutes so far. They're a team who have gone out hard, got a, taken a hot spot yesterday, then had a mechanical failure and just cruised for the rest yeah. of the day through the stage. So this could be the day that you know riders with the fresher legs have taken a day easier can come out and really aim for a stage win. So there's there's a battle on two fronts, stage win and then those battling for GCs, the overall. Yeah. GC battle is uh, hotting up. We've got uh, certainly, it's almost a head to head, you could say, between uh, first and second at the moment. We've got Cannondale Factory Racing, Scott Sram, um, and they're within two minutes, two minutes 41 of each other. And uh, that's for the top step of the podium. But this, the real f battle now is developing for the third step. That's between Bulls and Trek Salas and Marco. They're not truly cross-country specialists. They're both more or less in the same category as marathon races. Interesting to see how they do today, because today really is a test of the legs and a test of the ability to pace themselves. Yes, my own case head off. Yep. Winners of the Swiss Epic in 2017, they know all about marathon racing and they know about measuring their efforts. Today will be all eyes on them to see uh, what uh, what kind of time they post because they're also ominously moving up that leaderboard and the, and there's just 30 seconds between the less than 30 seconds between them and uh, Heineck and Fogerhardt as well in fifth and sixth so there's a little battles going on down uh, the uh, GC uh, leaderboard let's go back to Lara in uh, the uh, star shoot Urs, how are you this morning? You are already in the podium, so are you confident about today? Yeah, for sure. We feel good after yesterday, the second uh, place yesterday and third in the over, uh, overall now. Uh, it's a big motivation and gives us confidence for today, for sure. What do you think can happen today? I think uh, it would be really hard today because it's uh, just short, so you have to go full gas from the start to the finish. But uh, yeah, I think we're in a good shape and on a good way and uh, yeah, looking forward for today. But you are always riding full gas in the Apsake baby. Ah, uh, no, no, because on the long stage you have to, yeah, you have to manage very well with the, with the power you have and uh, because uh, it's also the next day, the next day is coming, but today, I think today is the day you have to go full gas for sure. Thank you, good luck. Thank you. Urs Huber with a broad smile there, looking quite relaxed. You don't often see Urs looking so relaxed. He's got Simon Stipjan alongside him, who started out as a cross-country man, but very much a marathon racer now on Team Bulls. Uh, and a team that, that I think uh, for the Bulls, they'll be very pleased being on the podium at this stage of the race. Uh, absolutely. It's uh, you know, halfway through the race, being in the position they are, Neil. It's uh, a great performance so far. And he says, we're not always going full gas, so that's a good sign. Yeah. It's a good sign that they're able to um, be aware of their efforts and measure their efforts. They are marathon racers, very much a marathon team, uh, not really uh, focused on the uh, UCI, World, UCI World Cup circuit. Uh, so they're specializing in these uh, long format races and uh, throughout the year we, we hope to see them at uh, the likes of the Pioneer and the Swiss Epic, see what they can do on, uh, in different parts of the world. So Ferraro and uh, Poro, the uh, Trek Seller San Marco team, and uh, they have stolen their way nicely into contention here, and uh, they could be uh, a threat today. And, and yeah, they're the ones who are looking to make up that time on the, the Bulls heroes. Uh, Ursuba and Damiano Ferraro, just 11 seconds between them on GC. These two need to make up that time today, and they uh, could be on the podium. Just talking about the uh, the time trial, it's, is it? slightly different uh, format in terms of uh, exactly what kind of physical effort you're putting out. People have been saying it's full gas. 
but it actually can't be full gas. You've really got to pace your efforts, and it could. It's uh, people talk about time trialing as a, as an art. It takes a lot of experience. Even the very finest time trialers on the road get it wrong. Uh, they all scout the course very carefully and know exactly. Ex if do they go 95% on the climb or do they go 96%? What kind of a gain are they going to get out of uh, going full gas or just backing off a little bit? And uh, certainly is a very very specialist technique to get your effort absolutely perfectly. The idea is to empty your tank the moment you cross the line is the moment you're empty. Uh, but riding a time trial on the, in a mountain bike stage race is then again quite different to riding a time trial on the road. On the road you look to just have that, that rev counter needle just hovering right on the edge of the red zone and keep it there the whole way yeah. through. And it's quite an even effort uphill on the flats and the downhill even power all the way through. However on the mountain bike you've got such steep technical descents that you are not pedaling. So you, you can afford to go a bit deeper into that red zone on the uphill, almost blow yourself up as you get to the top, and then you get to take a breather and your legs get to recover just a little bit on those downhills. So it's a, a real mix of power and skill and judging how deep you can go and then recover from that, that burst. So it's a lot more up and down the tempo. Well, there we're getting down to our last two teams. This is the uh, third place team, Steve John and Uber of the uh, Bulls Heroes. Uh, the Bulls Legends are Platt and Lecart. We saw them roll off a little bit earlier, but uh, now it's down to the uh, two top teams, the Scots Ram team and the Cannondale Factory Racing team. Let's hear from uh, one or two of those with Lara. Lars, how are you feeling this morning after yesterday's stressful uh, stage? Yeah, I've, I actually feel quite good. I hope uh, the legs recovered fine and uh, I've, I have a good feeling and uh, the tri time trial suites as well, so uh, we're looking forward. What do you think is going to happen? What do you expect from the leaders team? I think uh, today it uh, won't make a big difference. I think uh, on these trails everybody's a bit same for us, especially Cannondale and us. So I think uh, the race will be decided uh, next more days. Thank you, good luck. Thanks. Lars uh, saying that the remaining days will perhaps play a bigger role in the uh, outcome here. This uh, is going to be a fascinating battle, though. Two minutes and 41 down. There's not three minute gaps. And uh, there's no shortage of uh, spice between those top two teams at the moment. And that's just what you want in a race a little bit of uh, intense rivalry. The intense rivalry is uh, touted by the media, touted by, um, touted by fans. and. What's interesting is that the two are starting to get under each other's skin. It's not just uh, for the show, not just for the crowds, but a uh, little bit of antagonistic uh, actions going on. We can see that Nino is just a little bit riled after yesterday. Uh, Enrique, uh, no doubt, is smiling just a little bit extra broadly, hoping that Nino is watching. And uh, this starts to antagonize. When they antagonize each other, it could have a deadly effect on their teammates because if they're going too hard, they could very easily blow up their teammates. And maybe that's all part of the plan. Great challenge, great contest it is uh, as the Bulls head off here. So Urs Uber there just missing a, a, a cleat, cleat in there as he left the start uh, ramp. And uh, he's safe and sound there on the route. Here they are, the European champion, Lars Foster, and the world champion, Nino Schurter. We haven't seen him in those jerseys since Sunday uh, when they uh, were racing around the prologue course. They've been in yellow since then, but not today. Well, we have to wonder how many of those jerseys they brought with them. They may be uh, expected to wear yellow all the way through. And uh, let's hope that they've brought a few because uh, today they've got to make up 2 minutes 41. That's a lot of time to make up in a time trial of 40 kilometers. And uh, they might have to be wearing the same jerseys uh, tomorrow again. Yeah, I, I think they'll be realistic about it and be thinking they can take back some time, but not all of that time over a course of this nature and, and just 43 kilometres. It is pretty tough, a thousand metres elevation over 43 kilometres and having ridden the, the back half of the course, and it, is, it provides opportunities for riders who are feeling good to, to take time, but uh, that's a lot to take back on the likes of Fumic and uh, Avancini. Quick change of position. Well, it looks like it might be Nino leading off. He's on yeah. the, uh, got the inside line yeah. to turn one. Right, let's, uh, as these two wait to go off, let's go down and hear from the yellow jerseys with Laura. Manuel, how is it important to work as a team for today's time trial? 
I mean, this is one of the crucial stages in the past. It always showed they uh, open up some quite big gaps. So we're going to be really sharp and focused on this one because we 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 want to really attack this uh, this stage and uh, try to maybe uh, get some time into uh, the contenders and. Uh, no, but I'm, um, it's not going to be easy, but uh, we're good to go. What do you expect from the rivals? Well, the rivals, of course, they have to attack because uh, they have to chase us and get some time back from there on. I think it's going to be full committed today. And which one do you think are the key points of the stage? Well, I mean, there are a few key points, you know, it's just 40Ks long, for, uh, in the end it's just one long effort from the start to the end, you know, uh, kind of a sprint, so in the end they're not really key points, the whole stage is a key point. Thank you, good luck. Thank you. No question about what they're going to be about today. He's, uh, 43 kilometers a two hour effort. Yeah, it's pretty much a sprint, says Manuel Fu. <laughs> Well, here we go. The world champion Ino Schurter and the last Forster of Scott Stram MTB heading out on the mid-race time trial at the Absa Cape Epic. It's been brought a great dynamic to uh, the event and it brings uh, different teams and different riders into play. And uh, here, let's see how these two handle it. One of the biggest challenges uh, for, in fact, in the, in, the, in the race is someone finding the right partner for Nino. The strongest in the world. He's uh, almost unbreakable as a rider. Um, the match point is just really who you find to ride with a guy like that. It's a big responsibility riding with the world champion, riding with uh, who many refer to as the best ever cross country racer. And Lars Foster has done very well up until now. He has been so far so good. There were three from three, and only that uh, puncture, that long mechanical yesterday, that uh, brought them undone. But Foster has been up to the challenge so far. But the real work starts from now, midway in the race, the back end is going to feel twice as hard as the first few days. Now the course today is nothing like uh, the rough terrain that they endured yesterday, going up Lieberberg and then up uh, Krunlandberg and down the other side and the neck. It's uh, a lot smoother, these are pretty much manicured trails, they're in, in pretty good shape, but that doesn't discount uh, what can and uh, sometimes happens. Uh, a, a stone or a rock uh, pops out as we saw with Matt Beers yesterday on a wide open road. He, he fell and, and uh, hurt himself. So those things can happen and uh, so they've got to be aware of that. I was just about to mention the warm-up and how critical yeah. that is and we see uh, some of our elite women and there's uh, Annika Langval in the back of shot on the rollers doing their warm-ups and quite a lot of riders in the dark this morning pre-race that didn't have rollers with them. They're out on the, the road out towards the entrance of the Oak Valley estate here but getting the warm-up right and starting early enough so you know, a lot of preparation goes into the time trial up really early eating have everything digested a really good warm-up because if you go off the start line your legs blow up a bit your muscles are not quite warmed up properly you are going to lose massive amounts of time so it's tempting to not do it properly and not do a long warm-up because you're already so fatigued from the days of racing but uh, it is just so critical well part of being a professional rider you have to deny the uh, the luxuries of, of everyday life and uh, one of those warm-ups is one of those essential things that you just absolutely have to do and you have to do it properly there's a moment uh, between Abacini and uh, Fumich they uh, are good friends they are trade teammates they ride around the world in the World Cup circuit and uh, they've been at this race uh, now their third year together, and they built up a really good uh, friendship. And uh, you sense there's a good, good uh, camaraderie and, and the communication vibe between the two. A team that we've got our eye on today is uh, Team Crossbow. That's uh, Manticon Guterres and Andre Chink. It's uh, going to be interesting to see what sort of times they post. We have got an initial time check at 13 kilometers. They're one minute, 14 seconds ahead of MMR. A factory racing still the main teams to come. As you can see, that uh, the yellow jerseys are still on that start ramp. They've got a bit to go, got at least half an hour to go before they will hit that time check. So we'll be looking at uh, what the really fast teams are doing at that time check, at that 13 kilometer mark. Yeah, that's the beauty of a, a uh, time trial like, th like this. As away go the yellow jerseys, Henri Cavancini leading out uh, Manuel Fumic on this 43 kilometer test against the clock, against themselves and against their rivals, their equipment, it all comes into play at the Absa Cape Epic and nothing is left uh, to chance as we will follow this uh, group and as many as we can the women the leading women will be setting out uh, behind them uh, in the order with uh, the slowest of the teams right away to the leaders Anna van der Bregen and Annika Langfeld but this is the uh, early phase of the men's 
leaders effort around the 43k course so the long shadows is really st early start in the morning uh, really I think they'll probably welcome finishing really early as well they'll be uh, by the time uh, we hit 10 o'clock they'll be in their showers or have had their uh, recovery shakes and uh, just a little bit, just an extra hour or so to uh, to put the legs up and enjoy the rest of the day and uh, also do some planning for tomorrow what their tactics will be tomorrow will be interesting after today's uh, play out they swing through the uh, beautiful oak trees of which there are thousands on this uh, appropriately named uh, farm oak valley heading up past the old uh, the uh, school classroom and uh, through the orchards on the right hand side apples are the main uh, fruit grown on these trees here but uh, Obviously, there's plenty of great uh, vineyards, there's wine, there's uh, flowers as well they do on uh, Oak Valley. And also running a few cattle as well yep. out there in the fields. And yesterday when I was out there riding, I came across a, a small group of Bontebok so from the antelope family. So I felt like I was a little bit on safari. <laughs> I was uh, glad I didn't come across a Cape Leopard. I've, ha I've heard they are oh out yeah. there. Up in the mountains. I have been looking over my shoulder a couple of times just in case. So, you know, I'm not going that fast up the hills. But uh, for these riders, straight uphill out of the start, a couple of quick turns and up the farm tracks, but a, a drag uphill before they get to descend just a little bit into the area they call the amphitheatre. Yeah, so they head up uh, out of Oak Valley. The neighbouring farm is uh, all Kluver. And uh, in that is the amphitheater, which they'll go through twice. They'll go through it once uh, on the, at around five kilometers. They'll do a big loop and then come back through there, which is where the big water point for the day is. A little indication there from uh, Avancini returning right. And up they go. So yeah, they'll go through that amphitheater, which is a, a fantastic spectator vantage point. I don't know how many they'll be out there this time of the morning, but later on in the day, friends and families, it is going to be a great vibe out there for for everyone well, so far the crowd's been huddled down here at the around the start it's uh, clear skies and it's sunny but it was quite fresh it was about nine or ten degrees when the riders were heading off but now the sun is getting higher in the sky where that temperature's climbing up and they're gonna have something up around to 23 24 degrees today so it'll go from uh, jackets and beanies and hoodies to uh, t-shirts and flip-flops yep we saw some of the riders they were wearing their um, their trade team jackets a little warm sort of neoprene tile this type of um, type of material they uh, really keep nice and warm at the start this is so they don't use a single extra kilojoule of energy trying to stay warm all their energy is saved in their legs and uh, not necessarily because they're freezing cold at the start just they don't want to emit one single degree keeping absolutely everything for the big effort that's to come today in the 40 kilometer time trial of course it is uh, human rights day here so uh, a public holiday for uh, everyone in south africa so an opportunity to uh, take a break from the office and work school whatever it might be and uh, kick back and enjoy if you can't get here enjoy the coverage here otherwise uh, come and enjoy the great outdoors and the spectacle of the world's finest mountain bikers racing around the western cape this is still with our race leaders and it's the drag all the way up onto Paul Kluver and this is not a particularly steep drag but you were referring Robbie to to the uh, unrelenting nature of these climbs they're short sharp climbs all the way through this there's very little opportunity there are very few free k's yeah they're very few indeed this first part is the, the climbs are a bit more flowing they're not as steep when they go out this first big loop it's particularly the second half of this course gets very steep and uh, they ride their way up to the uh, Grunland Falls. You see the front wheel up and off the ground, so really whipping the biker out of that uh, hairpin bend for Enrique Avancini. Uh, race leaders there in the yellow jerseys. And way off in the distance, they may catch a glimpse. No, not even. The gaps are quite big between. Yeah, three so minute gaps, yeah. It really is a solitary effort, team against team, and you have really no indication of where the others are. Well, the indication that you might have would be really only at the time checks. So, Right, let's uh, now leave the uh, leading yellow jersey riders here and head down to the uh, start. And uh, at the start is Lara. Good morning, Marike. How is the team? Ready for today? Yeah, I think we're ready. Looking forward to a short stage. It's been a few tough days. How do you think it's going to be today? 
Uh, it's going to be hard. It's uh, it, actually you go harder the shorter it is. So it's going to be. But it's it's a nice route. Uh, lots of single tracks and lots of fun. And after today's stage, you are going to finish very early. So how are you gonna? How is the afternoon going to be for you? It's important to rest, I can imagine. Yeah, definitely. Looking forward to a longer recovery and maybe get some more sleep and a longer massage and, and everything and a bit more rest. Sounds good. <laughs> good luck. Thanks. Uh, to Laura that uh, keeps us up to date on uh, the women. We'll be uh, popping in and out of there periodically. That was Mariska Strauss and uh, Jenny Stenerhoch. And they are currently in fourth place on general classification and they're keeping themselves in the picture. Fair tree, silverback. Out of the saddle, up the climbs here for Manuel Fumich and Henri Cavancini. So they'll be getting some time checks at the 13 kilometer mark. They'll have their team dotted around the route. Uh, one thing that we've really noticed about this pairing and uh, in fact their backup team, there's eight crew members and they have spent a lot of time planning for this race exactly and uh, it'll entail having the uh, all of the backup crew or certain people at certain points of the race telling them exactly how far. They have the luxury of starting last so they will have the time split of Nino Schurter and Lars Foster. Which is who we're seeing on screen. A little bit of picture breakup. You must understand we're in quite a remote area and getting right up against uh, the, the mountains there. But uh, Nino and Lars, you see them just whipping through those corners and giving it absolutely everything. You've got no measure on what the others are doing and they really want to take back the biggest chunk of time possible. Steady effort from Fubich and Avancini as they start their time trial. Let's pop down to the start again with Laura. Ariane, today we have this short stage, but do you think it's also a key sp uh, stage in the race? I don't think you can make up that much time, but yeah, it's always, like every, every stage counts, you know, and you can always make a mistake and lose time, so um, I guess we just have to be uh, very smooth through the trails and try to feel the rhythm of the trail especially. How are you feeling this morning? Did you have time to have some rest and recover? Yeah, definitely. I would say right after the stage, I was feeling pretty broken and thinking like, oh, how is gonna tomorrow going to feel? But I actually managed to have a very good night and feel a bit fresher. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ariane Luti there. And a brief glimpse of the yellow jerseys powering along. And this may be uh, Ferraro and uh, his partner, Poro, the Trek Celis and Marco team and they are looking as you see behind them the uh, team chasing them as well so there will be opportunities on some of the early parts of this course as it opens up to be able to see the teams either ahead or if you glance behind you might catch a glimpse and there's nothing like that to uh, get the afterburners going if you see the team behind you. Uh, things getting a little bit tighter at the top of the table th through water point one, our first time check of the day. Still Andre Sig and Sergio Mantecon, the uh, Crossbur team with the fastest time, but just at 22 seconds behind it's uh, Meha and Catania, the 7C CBZ team. So they're pushing hard, 22 seconds off, but of course our top ranked teams on the overall classification yet to come through and post a time. That'll be our first good indicator after around half an hour of racing and uh, about of a third of a way into this time trial. Right, let's now catch up with uh, the women's team, the second team on uh, GC. And it is Candice Lill and Adelaide Morat. They trial by 23 minutes and 43 seconds. Adel, time trial day for you here at the APSA Cape, baby. What do you expect can happen? Uh, I think, to, uh, like, yeah, every day we try to do our best. Uh, so today it's a more shorter day, and yeah, uh, yesterday it was a quite hard stage, so we will look what the legs have left. <laughs> What do you expect from the leaders team, from Annika and Anna? I think they um, will smash it again, maybe. So I think a lot of teams will try today. Uh, but yeah, we will see which team will be in front today. Oh, the legs? I feel the days before. <laughs> but luckily we have a good uh, physiotherapist and yeah, they have been out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, good luck. Thanks. Thanks.
Here we go. Uh, that is uh, Adelaide Morat and uh, Candice Lill in second place for Team Summit. A nice reception there for the Polish champion on the left there, Maja Wostowska and Ariane Luti of Cross, Cross Spur Racing. Back for the men in uh, the pro the time trial. I keep wanting to say prologue. It's not. It's the middle of the week. <laughs> and uh, this is Avancini on the front and Fumich behind him. This uh, route is littered with uh, a lot of A-frames around these uh, these farm trails. So the professionals will have no problem uh, tackling this. This is what they do. Uh, some of the amateurs have come unstuck on those sections. You have to hit them at a bit of speed. The real danger is if you hit them and you don't quite get make it all the way up, and it really s it slows you down when you hit them. When you hit them, and if you don't quite. Uh, Getting your front wheel over that little hump, uh, you can come unstuck pretty quickly. Where, when you're in the middle of one of the, the Epic's really long, tough stages and you're completely fatigued, an A-frame like that can seem like a mountain. Yeah, it seems like a climb on its own. You, you know you have to just power into it. They're a little bit dangerous, actually. When you're coming downhill and you've got one of those uh, yeah. you know, fence crossings in the A-frame, you hit it too fast, you're absolutely going to launch off the other side and you know, in real danger going up and over the handlebars. So uh, sometimes you have to just... Uh, uh, use a bit of discretion, uh, break, uh, even though you don't want to, you'd love to hold speed, but um, staying upright is number one. We're going to be watching with interest to see uh, the proportion of work that uh, Enrico Vincini does at the front. It's often uh, an indicator as to who the stronger partner is, and uh, looks like it's Avancini today. Well, he's certainly doing the work early. Let's go down to uh, hear from the race leaders in the women's race. So we have a quite an advantage in the general now, so we try to make it safe through the day, um, have some fun on the single tracks, and uh, yeah, hopefully go fast but safe. How do you think it's going to be for the rest of the rivals? Um, well, I think number no, the numbers two and three are really going to fight for that that spot on the podium. Um, so they will go fast today. Hopefully, we can save a bit, recover today, and then. Yeah, for sure. After it, it will be fighting again in the other stages. Thank you. Good luck. Thank Thanks. Anna Van der Bregen and uh, Annika Langfeld, the leaders by 23 minutes already in the in the women's race. Difficult to see them uh, making any mistakes today, Robbie. It is difficult to see that, but you do never know. I mean, you're always so close to something going wrong in this race. But just interesting to hear Anna van der Breggen say, you know, the, the second and third are really going to be fighting hard for those spots, as if to say, well, we know they're not going to get close to us. But she also said we try and just ride a nice even tempo and find a little bit of recovery today. I still expect them to win the stage, but maybe not going out and smashing the field as they have in the other stages. And uh, sure, they'd love to win, but uh, they're not intent on increasing the yeah. gap by a lot today. Bit of robust psychologically uh, imperious in her analysis of talking about the other teams fighting out for second and third. That's really the right attitude you want to be uh, you want to be having when you are the world's best. But behind her, you see the, the focus of uh, Annika Langval checking the equipment, to checking on the suspension, sitting on the the front, and then you know doing a shoe up even tighter again, and just checking different things on the bike. That that complete focus that she has is the. Langfeld. Just like an assassin of the rest yeah. of the teams. And never resting on her laurels. I think that's the key to success in this, is that you never stop preparing, you never stop planning, and uh, it's, it's a matter of pretending that you're behind to stay ahead. Candice Lill and Adelaide Mora, Team Summit, are on the course now. The second last of our women's elite teams as we are hanging over the top of Nino Schurter and Lars Foster. Lars Foster was doing a, a quite a lot of the work early on. Now it's Nino's turn. And Lars Forster has uh, done a fair amount of work during this uh, this event. I think a couple of years ago when he won with Matthias Sternemann, we saw uh, Nino pretty much uh, piloting that ship all the way through the, the course. But Lars Forster, he's a very, very strong rider in his own right and has done a lot of the hard uh, work on the front. Fumich, who is he a little behind? Where's his partner? Where? Ooh, now there's a sign. Well, has that been a mistake, or is it just that the legs aren't cooperating at the moment? So uh, I haven't seen he just holding back and waiting at the moment. It'd be interesting to know if that was a, a mistake or a mechanical or just a physical problem. 
uh, sort of looked down, and that's always a telltale sign from a rider, looks down at his equipment and uh, suggesting that there may have been some malfunction, brief as it was, but that, that in a time trial like this, it can be costly. Well, it really is only up to the riders, riders themselves. They've got no one else to blame. If there's no other riders that can knock a derailleur or flick up a stone into their spokes or anything like that, it's all about uh, they can manage their efforts and their risk completely on their own. I uh, don't think we'll see too many mechanicals um, necessarily on a time trial like this. The racing's not quite as tight, not as close. Um, but still, having said that, anything can happen. It could be a little stone or a piece of, um, a piece of steel or something lying in the trail that they won't see. Um, but the risks are far lower in a time trial, for sure. Well, all seems to be back in order at the moment. I was just uh, having, having a try to take a closer look and see if uh, Fumis is still looking down or testing how he's pedaling, how the bike seems to be running, but uh, they look to be back on track. Maybe it was just a mistake in the trail and foot out of the pedal. It could be something just as simple as that. Well, let's see. We're, we're here. We're getting a replay. Yeah, let's see what uh, this might give us an idea. There we go. He's off. He's fallen. Did he fall there? On his bike. And off he goes. So, yeah, he uh, had a little bit of a, a washout with his uh, front wheel, went down coming out of the Paul Kluver bike park, and uh, that uh, was a costly little fall. It does happen yeah. so quickly. I mean, you're riding on the limit. You're really pushing with everything you've got. But it looks like he just got his, his front wheel just off the edge of the track, and it goes away from you very, very quickly when it's sandy like that. So no harm done, no mechanical, and uh, I'm sure it won't be the last little mishap we see from the teams out there on course as they're pushing to the limit. It'll be a big relief for these two that uh, nothing has gone wrong. There's no permanent damage, nothing that will affect their performance. But what could affect their performance is how they approach it. They don't want to panic. Fimich needs to just relax. It does break the rhythm of fall and um, a little bit of adrenaline rush when you get back on the bike and it's important not to go try not to try and go too hard in case you blow up. We've got the Bulls heroes. We've had reports on the course that um, the Bulls legends have been pretty slow out there today. It looks like they're not still they're still not aiming for that GC spot. They're gonna be taking it a little bit easier today so they can ride in support of this team here, the Bulls Heroes. Uh, another update from our first timing point. So still Sink and Mantecon leading. 22 seconds ahead of Meja and Catania. Matthew Beers and Alan Hatherley, their third best at the moment through that time check. 54 seconds behind. And then it is Caratero and uh, Murcio Vegara at 57. So things getting pretty tight at the top, but they're already fairly significant gaps after just 13 kilometers of racing. The Bulls heroes uh, up this really steep incline. Look how they uh, bent over the handlebars to get uh, maximum power out of those pedals and uh, crank their way up. So Zur Super and uh, Simon Steve John, third on GC at the moment. And that is, could be under threat from Trek Salas and Marco today because they're just 11 seconds. So the Italians are in fourth place. This is uh, the race leaders, it is. The Canada Factory Racing Pad. Now, Mancini, just careful not to go too hard. Probably just checking to see how Fumich is doing. Uh, there'll be a couple of questions. Are you okay? Everything all right? And just some confirmation from Fumich that everything's back on track. Slight delay. It would have delayed them by 15, maybe 20 seconds, that little, uh, that little fall of theirs. Not ideal, but all is not lost. Two minutes and 41 is the uh, number, the time between this pair and Nino Schurt and Lars Forster, who started after three minutes ahead of them. We've just looked at their, uh, at their equipment today. They're not wearing their hydration packs. So it's pretty clear that those hydration packs are not just for the convenience of having to not take the hands off the handlebars. It is definitely a nutrition strategy to uh, counter the, uh, the, the efforts of Scott. It looks like it's really a water point. Um, it's a water point strategy, in fact. Yeah, we, we've seen them use it in different ways. The first day they used them early on and then discarded them. And yesterday they took them on a mid-race and then they didn't stop once they took those hydration packs. And it worked out perfectly yep. too because the situation of the race with the Scott Stram team having that mechanical and being up to nine and a half minutes behind, well, it really gave uh, Avancini and Fumich an extra advantage to skip a water point and go all the way through to the finish without stopping. We, and then we saw that really illustrated perfectly when Scott Stram got to the last water point, 10 kilometres to go, and they had to stop. They had to stop in, grab a cup of water just to wet the whistle and then keep pushing through. But it did lose them another 15 seconds. So uh, it really 
Yeah, they've been worth their weight in gold, those hydration packs, and weight is why a lot of riders don't want to carry them. Yep. But uh, I think it's been a great move tactically by Cannondale. And the fact that they're swi switching it around, they're not always putting it at the same water point, uh, perhaps keeps the Scott guys guessing as to, um, as to when it's actually going to happen, when, which water point they are going to skip. And tactically, this is uh, playing into the hands of the Cannondale team. All part of planning and uh, the great preparation that uh, the team have put into this race. That's the fourth place team we were seeing, the uh, Trek Seller San Marco pairing of Ferraro and Porto. And uh, that battle is going to be so intense, just 11 seconds the gap from them up to third place, the Bulls heroes, Urs Huber and Simon Stibian. Porto on the front here, he's a, he's a marathon specialist, fifth at the World Champs, so he's, uh, this is his game, uh, marathon racing, perhaps not quite uh, the uh, shorter burst, but with 11 seconds you feel that they uh, they will be breathing down the neck, if not uh, overhauling Urs Huber and Super Steve John today. Race leaders in the yellow jerseys, Fumich and Avancini, and uh, one as we preferred to, one brief uh, little fall from Fumich is on the front here and working really hard up this uh, steep uh, ascent. The speed is deceptive there, are putting down maximum power and it just shows how steep and how tricky this, uh, this section of the course is. They measure their efforts perfectly so they hit that top there. As Robbie was saying, they just want to get into the red zone just as they hit the top and then they've got a bit of time to recover if the, uh, if the lactate levels uh, decrease they can be ready for the next steep incline. Well, we've just seen on that time check there that uh, Geismar and Kaes have now gone through checkpoint one and they've gone in front of Beers and Hatherley. So they're third fastest through there at 53 seconds behind our current leaders at that checkpoint, Sink and Manticon. We heard some of the teams, uh, one of the teams in fact was saying that, um, that there'll be some fresh legs out there, uh, riders who haven't necessarily put in maximum of a team cross spur. You could say take a took a day off yesterday. We saw them riding with the women's uh, with the women's category riders or with women's category leaders. So it means that they obviously knew that there was a problem. They weren't going to make up. Th they were way behind on GC already. Just uh, wrote off the day. Said that there's another day and we can win a stage. Rest their legs. And it looks like today is their target. Yeah. Well, here's what they've been doing. You we talk about our top teams, but Cross Spur are sitting in 33rd position overall, two hours and four minutes behind the lead. So they've had two days where they've lost a huge amount of time. They lost an hour the other day, but uh, somewhere in between they've lost another hour. So yeah, we saw them yesterday. They came out firing and won that first Dimension Day to hotspot. Uh, and then they had a mechanical, yeah. so they just uh, went easy again and they certainly will be targeting the stage win. And I think once you're out of contention, you've had a big mechanical problem, it's knocked you out of the GC, that's the way to go. Day off, day on, day off, go again. This is the Bulls uh, snaking down the uh, single track and uh, they're the team under pressure from uh, Damiano Ferrara and uh, Samueli Pora. Just going back to cross uh, spur, uh, the uh, men's team they uh, had a puncture yesterday early on after they'd won the hot spot uh, changed the tire at the uh, tech zone at the first tech zone before Grunenberg and set off at their fairly leisurely pace only do know that behind them their women's team had a puncture as well a similar area got to the tech zone took a spare tire put it on and uh, realized that they only a while later that they'd put on the uh, tire that had been uh, taken off their men's team and had a plug in it Plug came out, they had another puncture, so they lost uh, big time yesterday as well. Indeed, the professionals get uh, get a, a dedicated tech zone for them, and they have a, they don't have a, a, a huge amount of space. They each get allocated a small box, and they get allocated a section of wheels, so they can't put the whole kitchen sink in that section. They have to choose carefully what they leave behind, and of course, with three or four uh, tech zones that they have, uh, they've got to spread uh, they've got to spread the risk. They've got to decide what goes in each box. Well, they may have to just put something extra in there, like a piece of uh, red tape or red ribbon or something to tie around a wheel. This one has been used and is no good because when the women came through, they picked up the men's problem and had yeah. to fix it. So well, it may be a way to signal that this one is dead, do not use. The, the, the point was made, it must be said, that uh, that tyre looked a little dirty when they put it on. So there may have been a clue in that as well. <laughs> uh, this one's been used. As we sit with uh, the very best in the business, Nino Schurte, enjoy his skills, his brilliance here. He doesn't waste an ounce everything. He powers out of the corner. Look at him out of the saddle. 
absolutely fantastic to watch the best. And Forster struggling yeah. to see Forster. He's had that front wheel wash out, got the foot out the pedal and saved it. Uh, he's really being pushed to his limit by Nino Schurter. You just see Nino shifting left and right, just making the bike snake its way along the track. And Forster, he's at full stretch to be able to keep up. Both Swiss, uh, Swiss riders, this program in Switzerland is uh, truly remarkable and incredible athletes coming out of Switzerland. Florian Vogel, a former teammate of, uh, of uh, Nino Schurter, with Matthias Sternemann, all top riders in their own, in their own right. <laughs> Nino's still having a lot of fun out oh there. Yeah. You see it's the little talent. whip over that jump as well by the world champion. So uh, it's all business, yeah. but when he gets the chance and he can launch, he's going to send it. I tell you what, I think it's going to be a day, or at least a short one for Forster, who's going to be hanging on here by his handlebars because Schurter is going absolutely flat box here. Well, that looked to me like he had an actual smile on his face. Yeah. He looked back with a bit <laughs> of a grin and a laugh. He said, see the whip? Did you see yeah. the whip? It's brilliant to watch. Always working on his highlights reel. Yes, he doesn't miss a chance, does he? Fubich and Avancini, the race leaders here, and they are behind Schurter and the, the uh, brilliant Lars Foster will give you a time split as soon as we get one. Popping across the road, more wonderful s windy single tracks. As uh, Jose Omidas referred to them, he's riding like a snake through these. Well, there are lots of snakes today. A lot of these trails bear uh, the names of uh, snakes, Cobra, Boom, Slung, Pofoda. Uh, so uh, they're fantastic trails. Well, we've uh, heard uh, a few times over the last couple of days from Jose Hermida, who's riding here with Purito Rodriguez. And Hermida has been talking about the track a lot and saying it's just like a snake. So today he really gets his wish. He gets to ride all the snakes. Absolutely. Fumic on the front here. And Avancini. Beautiful flowing trails. They have been uh, damaged by the fires again earlier this year, not long ago. Uh, thankfully brought under control. Oh, we we'll watch the uh, yellow jerseys. Just having a look at the time check. Uh, this is at the 13 kilometer mark. This team here, the Cannondale Factory Racing in yellow, still have to reach that time check. But looking down the significant names on the list, Scott Sram Racing have hit the time check. They are the best so far at that 13 kilometer mark. Second spot, provisionally, Cross Spurs, Manticon Gutierrez and Andre Schenk and in third place, 7C CBZ Willier. Fourth place, notably, at that time check, Bulls Heroes and fifth Trek Salison Marker. The time gap between Trek Salison Marker and the Bulls is under 10 seconds. So, absolutely evenly matched these two teams, Bulls and Trek Salison Marker. We're briefly in the Pine Singles there with uh, the uh, media e bike following the Scott Sram pair. Well, going into the stage, the Bulls Heroes in third overall had an 11 second buffer back to the Trek Celis and Marco team, and they're seven seconds ahead at the first time check. So they're out to 18 seconds ahead of them on GC, which we expected that to maybe go the other way in yeah. this time trial, but it is very early days yet. In the Pines again, they're sitting behind Foster and Schurter. It's a tremendous section. If you're riding, if you don't have to race this, this is a really fun section of the trail. Um, attracts many riders from all over the world and uh, some Cape Town locals often come here on the weekends just to enjoy this uh, little section through the forest. Incredibly rewarding and engaging single track. Just to put our viewers around the world into context, we're about 80 kilometers uh, up the coast, up the east coast of South Africa. Not on the coast, from Cape Town that is, and uh, about uh, 50 k's from uh, the coast on the eastern side and much closer towards Cape Town, towards Gordon's Bay, Somerset West Strand and that area, but about 80k drive from uh, the centre of Cape Town. And Lars Foster behind and Nino Schurter taking the lead, setting the pace. Lars has got his work cut out for him, all he has to do is just follow the line, check the body angle, check the lean, check the line, check where the tyres are going and follow the, world's, the world champion all the way through. Easy job. Easy job, and uh, <laughs> certainly a guy who's up to the task. He's, uh, yeah. Let's not forget, he is the European champion, and most of the top riders in the world are from Europe. And uh, not only that, uh, the top rider in the world is from Switzerland, and he's Swiss too. So if it weren't for Nino Schurter, who knows? Back with our race leaders in the yellow jerseys is Schurter, and uh, his partner forced to drop out of the, the pines. These two are heading there. 
look pretty tough for any Swiss riders. It's hard to be the best in the world when you're only the second or third best in your country. country yeah. <laughs> when you've got the world champion from Switzerland, Nino Schurter, and uh, you've got a lot to live up to. This is the Bulls Heroes through the S Bend. Had a good Open showing at the course. Sorry, yeah, we had a good showing for them at the at the time check fourth. In fact, at the moment now we've just seen the time check. So this is the pretty much the official or unofficial official result. All the teams are through the first time check at 13 kilometers, and it's still Scott Stram racing Nino Schurter and Lars Foster in the lead. And even though they had a bit of a crash, Manuel Fumic less than a second behind. Well, they're on even time here on the timing. 30:27. It says Lars Forster, and then the next one through Manuel Fumic, then Avancini, and then Schurter. So that's the order the timing Matt has given. So they yeah. are in a deadlock. Fantastic, and that is as uh, Neil alluded to there. After Avancini and Fumic had had a little bit of uh, an issue when Fumic uh, came down, they maybe lost a couple of seconds there. There it is. Couldn't be closer. Amazing. It is early days, 13, so 30 to go. And the adrenaline will be pumping. So this is an indication uh, that, considering that Fumic fell, it's an indication that the Cannondale team could be a little bit stronger on the trails, unless Nina Schurter and Lars Foster are measuring their efforts a little bit more carefully. Looks like a man against man. It's uh, Cannondale Factory Racing with the well, upper hand. We have seen on the, the, the big open point-to-point -point stages that it's been... Cannondale really pushing the pace. Avancini always keen to be riding on the front and trying to push things along. We've seen the Scott Stram team sit back a little bit more and then measure their effort. But when they do wind things up and fully open the throttle later on, where they've just been able to gap everyone, and maybe that's their tactic for this time trial as well. Just ride tempo and then increase it all the way through and then really open up the burners in the final one third of this time trial. And the Swiss are very good planners, very good planners in general and also in, in the mountain bike stage race field. They all know that the last section of the course is really tricky. They'll need to save something for a really steep section of the course and uh, they need absolutely all their power to get over that really quickly. We're on board with Stefan Sandel, the media bike behind Foster and Schurter. Just incredible images of these uh, World's best riders, We're absolutely thrashing it down here. And lucky to have the e-bikes. It's an incredible initiative. We've got really trails from the from the actual uh, from the bike, real action. We can get a sense of what the riders are going through. See the way that bike is leaning around the corners, just how fast they're really going. Notably, the tires of the bikes in front are really 2.3 inches wide. The tires of the e-bike e are 2.6 inches, really thick rubber, lots of tread, uh, very heavy but certainly designed to take the corners really fast. A lot oh, easier so to ride. They have very heavy tires. I'm sure they're only riding something like about uh, a 90 TPI, so a much heavier rubberized sidewall and much less risk of puncturing like we saw from Lars Foster yesterday on those tires. We spoke about the 170 TPI yeah. thread rating on the side, so it makes them much lighter. They roll much better, but they are less puncture resistant and it really put a dent in their hopes yesterday nine and a half minutes behind it was impressive to see them come back and take three minutes back really quite quickly but then they plateaued and in fact in the end uh, with that last water point where Scott Sram did stop in Cannondale held them and then took another 15 seconds towards the end so they got the work cut out to take this time back absolutely you know should have just popping in the air as he jumped out of that single track absolutely nailing it is Nino should have fantastic to see him uh, chasing. So often we used to see Nino Schurter on the front and setting the pace and uh, managing the, the race. He's now the uh, chaser hunting down the Canada Factory Racing Team. It's not uh, the capture, if it happens, is not likely to happen today, but it does set it up for the remaining days of this Absa Cape Epic to be a absolutely riveting viewing. The Queen stage tomorrow from Oak Valley to Stellenbosch is a monster. They go over two uh, mountain ranges, the Hottendots Holland, down the uh, compulsory portage, the Hunto Pass, and then uh, over the Helderberg range as well and into Stellenbosch's uh, legendary trails. And that uh, could be a day for a big move. Snaking away with uh, Fumich and Avancini now onto the trail. We've just seen Schurter and Forster no time between them as they went through the 13 kilometer mark absolutely dead heating so the time gap on general classification still at two minutes and 41 seconds as 
Fumic, the German champion on the front, and the Brazilian champion and world marathon champion behind him. He doesn't wear the world champion stripes because the Absa Cape Epic aligns with cross-country rules and regulations uh, as per the UCI. So national champions in cross-country could wear their jerseys, but not in marathon and likewise for the world champions. Every effort out of the uh, berms and out of the saddle just to power through, keep the tempo high, keep the momentum going, couple of pedal strokes. They look so smooth and look so easy for them, but just have a look at the tyres and uh, just a little skip on the, uh, on the traction. Tyres just skidding a little bit, just shows how hard they are going. They make it look super easy, but uh, just a little closer look and you can see exactly how much on the limit they really are. Yeah, they're not holding back here. 43 k's of one solid effort from uh, these leading teams. Of course, the uh, back of the field will be going out to all the way through the morning. The last ride is expected to finish around about 3.30 this afternoon. They have 4 hours and 15 minutes is the maximum time allowed. Up this steep climb, the last Forster on the front with Nino Schurta. Quick glance over his shoulder. Did he doubt that Nino would be there? There he is. And they're heading towards the uh, midway mark of this race, the amphitheater. So they'll come back into the amphitheater area at Paul Kluver, which is where the uh, spectator point at the water point is, and then head out on the second loop, which takes them around the, uh, the very much more technical trails. Oopsie, a little bit of a... Uh, Diversion there, but no problem. They're on to the climb together. Well, you see how steep that is now. The smallest gear for first, at forcing it in the sea, just offline. And Nino on that smoother part of the track on the left hand side. But Nino is himself was out of the saddle. This is incredibly steep, over 20% the gradient here. <laughs> first images of our race leaders in the women's race Annika Langville and her partner Anna van der Breggen of Investec Songo Specialized have been utterly dominant throughout the week and uh, they set off now with a 23 minute lead over the Summit Fin Pair. Quick drink for Lars Forster there. You've got to take the opportunity when you get it, when you're on these farm tracks, you get a flatter section that's uh, not so bumpy. Reach for the bidon, take a mouthful and then keep going and uh, whether you're thirsty or not, just grab it when you can because the technical part of these co this course it's just not the opportunity. Yeah, back with the yellow jerseys now. Beautiful images with the uh, morning light that casting those uh, long shadows through these spectacular farmlands. Well, you couldn't script it better so far that the two top teams who have had their run-ins, not just in the race, but uh, on the microphone as well, that they are just deadlocked at that first time check. It is almost like it is scripted because they know that, it, it's almost like they know that uh, each team from each, uh, each cr backup crew from each uh, team is going to be reporting back exactly what those time splits are. And it's uh, almost a matter of saying, there we go, I've matched you, I'm matching you. What have you got? What have you got? Yeah. Yep, toe to toe and blow for blow. Those of you might be joining us for the first time and wondering where the Investic Songo Specialized men's team uh, is. Yaroslav Kulhavi and Sam Gay. Sadly, Sam Gay's had that crash on stage one, road stage two. Didn't feel great on the bike. They lost a lot of time and then rolled out yesterday and then abandoned as a result of the effects of that uh, crash. And uh, the suspect a little bit of a concussion. And uh, Yaroslav Kolhavi rode on yesterday on his own, as he's allowed to do. And in fact, came in handy because he helped uh, Matt Beers with a, a wheel change when he had his crash. So uh, he, they're not racing as a team. Of course, Kolhavi can ride on with a blue number and in the Leopards jersey as uh, a solo rider. But he won't uh, get a, an official finish uh, as this race is only about uh, two-person teams. Avancini onto the front. Fumich holding his wheel. The beautiful sloping vineyards here on a relatively cool climate, great for the uh, white wines. They've found that line a little better and they've got this steep climb, short but sharp climb. You want to avoid those ruts, find the line on the left hand side. 
Good idea to avoid the rats, Robbie. Oh, absolutely. I uh, ran into a bit of a water rut yesterday on a downhill and uh, I was almost sitting here in commentary and only could have uh, one side facing the camera because if it had actually gone down, there wouldn't have been much left of the, the right side of my face, I think. Yeah, you don't want Some to say it would be an improvement, but you know. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to get in those uh, rats uh, at high speed going downhill. These guys are capable of dealing with that. So. Avancini takes his turn on the front. Back for the world champion and the European champion, Schurter and his partner, Forster. Doing the chasing today. Benefited from uh, their support team, but only after a long wait yesterday. It was Arno de Toy uh, who eventually donated a wheel. He and Julian Jessup riding for Team DSV. Certainly was a perfect storm for them. They had, uh, they had the tyre issue to begin with. They had the slightly lighter tyres, they had uh, Lars Foster on the back foot, a little bit uh, under pressure on the downhill and also the uphill too. Uh, they had that core, the, um, the anti-flat core that they, uh, that they put into some of the, some of the professionals used to avoid uh, snake bites, avoid slashes in the tyre and uh, of course one fundamental thing is they didn't have a tyre lever with them by the looks of things, one small piece of plastic. Uh, the, final, the final nail in the coffin for that uh, costing them nine minutes at some stage. Well, Gerald, you just mentioned the backup team for Scott Sram as Julian Jessup, uh, Arno Detoy. So Detoy and Jessup putting in a solid ride through water point one the first time check. They're sitting in 11th place. So 11th quickest through there. One minute 42 behind the time of their team leaders and those uh, riders of Cannondale. Well, Julian and Arno, very much uh, cross country uh, guys. Arno won every age group uh, national title up to uh, under 23, I think, in uh, South Africa. And Julian, likewise, a little bit younger, but uh, a very talented young uh, cross country racer. And the chance to race in support of the Scots Ram team, a wonderful one for them. And they've played a bit of a role already by donating that wheel. Henri Gavancini and Manuel Fumich do not have the luxury of a backup team. And so far, they haven't needed one. Well, it looks uh, just a bit of a dusty mark on the shorts of uh, uh, Manuel Fumich there. It looks like there's no cuts, there's no tears in the shorts, which is often a good indication that it hasn't been that bad a fall, perhaps just a, a bit of a sit down. And uh, yeah, very unlike the, uh, the shorts of Matt Beers when he came in yesterday, absolutely ripped up and the blood already pouring out of it. A gruesome scene um, for the Specialized Foundation NAD team. They drop into uh, the single track once again. A maze of uh, incredible trails built over the years in this part of the world. Elvin Cabo Valley. It is a mountain biker's mecca. And uh, they snake all around these farmlands. Incredible cooperation from the uh, landowners and the farmers to allow these trails to be built, to allow these races to come through. Certainly 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, these trails did not exist. Mountain biking was really only limited to narrow farm roads and maybe the odd bit of single track, uh, some rocky remote single track, but nothing like the groomed trails we have today. The sport has absolutely exploded in this region and in fact uh, around the world. And South African mountain biking is uh, among the best in the world. People come from all over the world and um, certainly the, with the team we're looking at right now spent a lot of time in Stellenbosch. They spent a lot of time in the, in the Cape Town, the Western Cape region, uh, trading, preparing themselves for the uh, upcoming World Cup uh, circuit, the UCI World Cup. Of course, being uh, for a lot of these riders a uh, big highlight of the season, uh, big world championships in, in cross country, and then the build up will be the UCI World Cup races all around the world. Cape Town, the best place, best place to prepare for it. Just caught a glimpse of uh, Scott Sam passing through the uh, tech zone at the Paul Kluver Amphitheatre as we now flick over to the women's race. Fourth place on GC, Mariska Strauss and uh, Jenny Stenerhach. And the Fair Tree Silverback team are going nicely. Jenny, not quite as uh, a fait with the pure single track and uh, cross country style racing. Mariska is very much a cross country racer, raced a number of the World Cups last year and did really well as she improved through the year, and, uh, particularly at the World Championships. But they'll uh, regroup the power of Jenny Stenhark to close in on her partner. So Stenhark's still uh, looking like she's got that bandage around her arm. Hopefully that's healing up nicely. She had a very hard day yesterday, grimacing uh, through uh, some of the stage, certainly on the really uh, steep sections of climbing. And uh, Mariska Strauss, quite a lot younger than her. And uh, the youth is uh, 
The youth is definitely on her side. Well, when you've got an injury like that, you really do need to keep it covered and keep it clean. So you can't afford to just to think, oh, it's going okay, I'll take the bandages off. Because yeah. you know, you've seen how filthy the riders come in at the end of these stages. And i uh, just got to say, uh, for all those watching our coverage, we, we just, uh, we're being told there are uh, absolute truckloads of Spanish and Brazilians following uh, the race. So, uh, buenos dias, a bom dia to those in Brazil and uh, Spain. We uh, love that you're following the coverage. We know there are, are many uh, Enric Avancini fans tuning in. And also for the, the Spanish riders, we've got a big Spanish contingent here racing the Cape Epic this year as well. This is through that... Uh Paul Kluver Amphitheatre area heading out towards the tech zone. It is incredible, this, uh, the bridges that have been built over this uh, riverbed. Amazing. Uh, Dr. Paul Kluver has been very much uh, himself uh, driving the, the, the diggers and uh, chopping trees down. And uh, incredible over the years what they've done here. Well, there's a lot of new bridges out on the course too. The, the section I rode yesterday, the second half of the course, there, there must be 10 or 12 brand new bridges uh, out there. And of course, uh, much of that was necessary after the fires ripped through here not so long ago. Yeah. So the bridges that were there were just incinerated. Mm, they were. You can see the fires. It's jumped tracks. It's jumped farm roads to, to get to the next section. You see it even here completely burned out. What it does do for the riders is make this course a little bit easier in terms of vision, where the course is going, uh, where, how the corners open up or, or close down a bit more. Normally those bushes are big enough in between. You can't really get a handle on the corners and where the course is going. So technically, a little bit easier, although still difficult. Ariane Luti, Maya Wostowska, after their disappointing day yesterday when they had those uh, puncture issues and uh, took the wrong wheel from their tech zone. They've got time to make up, but they were remarkably composed uh, at the end of the day here. Uh, yesterday, Ariane's smiling, and uh, you know, that's racing. She's seen it all before, and uh, they've got, she knows exactly how long this race and how much is to come. Uh, that they can make it up. And in fact, Ariane Luti has uh, recovered from, a, from an hour deficit and to still win a race, so she knows that all is not lost. There's still a lot of time to go, a lot of opportunities to make back that time that they lost. They'll be uh, almost pleased that their bad luck day is over. That they've had their they've had their bad day, and that um, that they hopefully won't have any more. But uh, if luck if Lady Luck only strikes once, it's already struck, and uh, now they've just got to look forward to the rest of the race and to try and make back some of that time on the second place rider Summit Finn. It's clear out in the trails that they you could arguably say that they're slightly stronger than the team uh, team Summit Finn. They've had some good results earlier on, and uh, just uh, eking back into that advantage to um, hopefully get that second place back and uh, possibly even challenge for the win if any disaster befalls the Investec Songo Specialized team, although it looks pretty likely that they're, uh, that they're gonna hold on to that yellow jersey. It is a, there's nothing like it, a bit of invincibility as a psychological advantage, but Ariane Luti knows full well that anything can happen. Absolutely, it's uh, six minutes, just over six minutes between Ariane Luti and uh, Maya Wojtowska and the second place team of Candice Lill and Adelaide Morat, so uh, they'll be chipping away at that today. Meanwhile, we're with uh, Enrique Avancini and uh, his partner Manuel Fumich, 20 kilometers in, beautiful uh, trails. These riders are absolutely getting the best that Oak Valley, Elgin Krabo can throw at them. Now with Scott Sram, snaking along the edge of the forest uh, trail here. every single opportunity they get to get out the saddle and gain uh, a few meters a little faster. Nino Schurter is doing just that. Of course we're all fascinated to know exactly how the timing is working and, uh, and how, how fast these riders are going. It looks like uh, from the, uh, the informal time checks along the way our spotters are uh, saying that uh, there's a 20 second advantage that the Cannondale riders have over Scott Sram. Well, that'll be, as we saw at the first official time check, there was nothing between them, literally nothing. But they're heading towards uh, another checkpoint at uh, 20 kilometers. We'll have to gauge then what the gap is. Manuel Fumich and Henri Cavancini have ridden a uh, very measured race so far, apart from that one little off from Manuel Fumich. You might just think this is just like a cross-country course. It is laden with... Uh, Single track and switchbacks. 
There's one of those bridges. Looks as though it may have been uh, rehabilitated fairly recently. Again, Fumich just a little bit off uh, the back of uh, Abensini here. We've seen this a few yeah. times. The gap's just starting to open up. Maybe they're, you know, they're pushing really hard and they're, they're doing well time-wise on the clock, but uh, only around halfway through. And got to be careful they don't blow themselves up. It's very easy to go out too hard in a time trial. And then you lose way too much on the way back in. This will be our Bulls heroes. Trying to defend that third place from the onslaught of the Trek Sella San Marco Italian team. And just like the Canadel uh, and, and the Scott guys, they were pretty much evenly matched with the uh, Trek Sella San Marco at that 13 kilometer mark. They're still going to reach that, still going to get a time check, a uh, report on what's happening at the halfway mark at the amphitheater. That's the Paul Clue, the amphitheater. Very interesting section there with the, all the bridges and, uh, and uh, features of the of the of the course today with lots of spectators that's exactly the halfway mark let's see what uh what kind of times the trekkies and the bulls are posting you made mention of our viewers uh, uh, from spain and uh, brazil welcome to there are 140 spanish athletes riding in in the race which is the second biggest contingent of uh, riders outside of the south africans and the 31 brazilians but uh, we know the brazilians bring such uh, verve and color and vibe to to the event it feels like there are 130 of them yeah, yeah 31 brazilians is worth a couple of hundred yeah, from anywhere yeah. else it's uh, the vibe and the noise they bring and uh, always uh, great to have them in the race and uh, along the race route there's always yeah you, know, you might have 31 in the race you've probably got another 60 or 70 out here supporting yeah, and uh, enjoying the race and cheering their athletes on yeah, right. Through that second uh, water point, second time check, it's uh, Luis Meja and Johnny Catanio who are the fastest at the moment, the 7C CBZ Willia team. They are, at the moment, 47 seconds faster than Mantecon and Andre Sink from Cross Spur. But of course, our top ranked teams yet to come through that water point. Yeah, this is the beauty of a time trial. The full story is unfolding as we go along and it. Uh, the last uh, line of the uh, the book will be written as they cross the finish line. You never know. Look at the effort now again from Urs Huber and Simon Sivjan on another of these steep vineyard climbs. This part of the world well known for those uh, vines that cling to the side of the steepest looking uh, mountains. And quite often these riders will have to uh, ride up them. As they will, they'll find out as they get closer to Stellenbosch some of those really tough vineyard climbs. Well, we're looking here at the Bulls heroes, but uh, out on course also, the Bulls legends of Alban Lakata and Carl Platt doing a little bit tough. They're 12th at the moment through that intermediate time check at halfway, but four minutes and eight seconds behind the time set at the moment by Catania and Meja. Having a bit of a tough day, the two legends. Yeah, I mean, uh, they're an interesting uh, situation because this is their number one team. They're in third place overall now. And they did come into the race with three teams, two of which were GC contending teams. Platt and, uh, and Lakata had a fairly decent day on the second day on uh, stage one, but uh, it all went fair shape for them on stage two where they had massive uh, puncture issues and lost huge amounts of time. But they have Simon Schneller and Martin Fry, who are not that far off the pace on GC, so they'll be riding in support. And uh, will this allow Lakata and, uh, and Platt to have a final round, one of the big marathon stages, and go for a stage win uh, closer to uh, the finish at Val de Vie? Who knows? And a fantastic day on uh, stage one. That was on Monday. And, uh, just uh, measured their efforts and uh, got a podium. It was uh, quite an amazing sight. And we're in a, living at a very special time, actually, at the moment of the race because we've got the, 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 the first winner of the Absa Cape Epic in 2004, Carl Platt. And he's still doing podium interviews in this uh, in today's uh, today's times. So uh, I think this will we're probably very lucky. This will be one of the last times we see that kind of thing go on. First winner, um, joint winner was Money Hamans, and he's long since retired. Carl Platt still at the top end of the sport if he's finishing on the podium at the 2018 Absa Cape Epic. So he's the leader, uh, leaders of the women's category. Anna van der Breggen is the the lady just in front of our e-bike camera following her teammate, Annika Langval. Hathley and Beers in the red yeah. jerseys, leading the uh, 
African jersey. That's Hathley in front. Uh, easy to tell them apart. Hathley, the smaller of the two, the lanky man with the white bandaged arm. Is Matt Beers took, taking that heavy fall yesterday. And it's always the day after a fall, you feel at your worst. Uh, you know, you, you crash, you get up, the adrenaline's flowing, your muscles are still warm, but it's when you, you stop, you rest overnight, everything stiffens up, the swelling starts to, to go up, the bruising comes out and you really do feel quite stiff. And when it's on the hip, uh, like uh, Matt Beers had, it really throws you out. Everything is not functioning like it should. You start to sit a little bit side saddle. You get less power out of one leg. So it, uh, it really is a big blow when you, you land on your hip, you put out your hip, you put out your back. Uh, it's going to be a struggle. You yeah, saw there Hathaly going down that descent uh, incredibly fast. He started out life as a, as a downhill racer and uh, eventually moved to cross country as a young man and uh, cut his teeth on the uh, Spur series, that incredible uh, series that uh, breeds our South African young uh, cross country races. Look how steep this is. I've got to say, Be uh, Beers still looks to be pedaling really nicely. I was trying to get a good head on view to see that sort of alignment, and, mm -hmm. and he still seems to be pedaling really nice and smoothly, not t seeming to favour one side. So he may have got off that uh, crash fairly well. I won't say lightly because I saw the blood streaming out and the, the cuts he had on his hip, but uh, he's looking quite good at the moment and not looking in trouble following Hathley, particularly on that steep section. And these are the two best South African mountain bikers, arguably, that uh, we have at the moment in um, this country, and it's a pleasure to see them riding at the top end of the sport and um, really dicing it out with uh, the likes of Nino Scherter and uh, Enrique Avancini. I'd say one thing, Beers looks fairly comfortable uphill, but he looks a little bit ginger on the downhill sections yeah. and into the corners, and it, it does throw your confidence when you've had a big off like that. Yeah, you're talking about the physical uh, uh, feelings that, of, of coming off a bike, and it's the mental ones that, that, that uh, really do get, get under your skin. And yeah, you see the, the cuts and the blood and the, the bruising, but uh, yeah. it's the psychological scars yeah. that are, are harder to, to discern. But um, certainly the day after you... It is a case of uh, once bitten, twice shy. It takes the edge off the performance a little bit, just on the edge of the, uh, the, the ability to take those risks. And uh, just not quite uh, the same. We all know that races are one on a knife edge, and uh, if, it just, if your edge is off, it's not quite, uh, you don't quite have some, as a, the advantage that you used to if you uh, are a particularly skillful rider. Matt Beer is a very good rider on the marathon circuit in South Africa. Riding Grew up the racing the motocross. Uh, yeah. You know, he's he's not uh, he's no stranger to, to falling to off, off and yeah. accidents. And uh, you know, uh, it hasn't been his first one, and it won't be his last one. Well, that is why he's a mountain biker, because he had a really bad off on, on the on the motocross circuit in the states. He was racing in the states, and uh, he had to rehab for quite a long time. And uh, they discovered, uh, whilst he was rehabbing on, the, on on a bike, that in fact he had incredible power. And they said, "Hang on, you know, what about it?" And uh, he. Uh, dropped the engines and uh, turned to, to mountain biking and he popped on the scene about six years ago and he longer, much longer hair, the mullet down to below the, below the shoulders and started winning races uh, with relative ease. I've heard similar stories so many times, cycling's really been the, the benefactor of uh, other sports yeah. injuries. I've had uh, rowers come across, they've had to rehab different injuries, get on the bike, all sorts of people uh, in fact one of the best road riders in the world recently retired the Australian Simon Gerrans he was also a motocross rider had to rehab uh, after a knee reconstruction and the guy has won Milan San Remo Liège Baston Liège won the yellow jersey in the Tour de France and you know, there's uh, many instances of, of that happening so uh, cycling really benefiting uh, getting these incredible athletes in our sport no no shortage of examples there we have Bart Brenchens too in fact who had to rehab after an accident and Bart Brenchens went on to become Olympic champion the first Olympic champion in cross-country mountain biking just watch this first corner here they ride out of here and straight into the sand it was a tricky little section and we just cut away right so we're hit that piece of sand of course but uh, it's those are the things that there's real changes of of terrain and changes yeah. of surface from that really nice dirt and then the gravelly farm track and then you turn in through the gates you take a berm and you think everything's good suddenly you hit the deep sand yeah focus and concentration here all the time this is our leading women's uh, team uh, langville and van der bregen van der bregen at the back yeah just following the lines of the uh, world marathon champion and has also been the uh, World Cross Country Champion, Anna Verregan, the Olympic Champion, and of course the World Road Champion. Lots of champions in that sentence. <laughs> no. 
just to, to let you know that the leading team uh, that have uh, finished is the cross Spurred team, and they're sitting down uh, not far away from us. One hour, 42 minutes, and 39 seconds. And in fact, they're sitting in uh, the hot seat. Yeah. It's a beautiful red couch, and they get to, they get to sit there for a while. Hopefully, it uh, doesn't switch around too much. They get to enjoy the limelight until the top teams come in. Well, that is uh, Cross Spur, Sink and Mantecom went out early. We saw them win the Dimension Day to hotspot sprint yesterday. They had some bad luck, and then they've just sort of cut their losses, uh, sat up a couple of times, saved energy, and then gone out after the big prizes. But yesterday, after winning that hot spot, they had another puncture. So they lost themselves an hour yesterday and then turned their attention to this time trial and they have given it a really good shake. And through the intermediates, they had been sitting at the top of the table for quite a long time. But then we're expecting Cataneo and Meja to come through and take over the lead because at the halfway intermediate point, uh, our current hot seat Occupiers were 47 seconds behind. Peter Farahard and uh, Christian Heineck. This is the Kenyan team. The man on the front, the young man on the front, is prodigiously talented. A World Cup champion at the moment of the cross country. Won the World Cup series last year. We've just seen the world champion in the under 23s. That's the World Cup under 23s for Farahard. So he's uh, Christian Heineck knew, I think, uh, before today started that he might be in the hurt box today. It's not his discipline, the short, sharp uh, events and races. But he'll hang in there with this young man. He's tapping on a great rhythm. The Norwegian, that could be moving up on the uh, general classification standings. They are involved in a, in a very good uh, battle of Hagard and Heineck. Beers and ba Hathley behind them. Kess and Gesma ahead of them. This man won the Stellenbosch World Cup last year. Won two more through the year to put his name uh, at the top of the stands at the end of the year. Didn't go quite as well in the World Championships. Which uh, saw Alan Hathaway take the top step. I think Christian Heineck, the 38-year-old, quite happy to let uh, figure out set the pace. But he'll be making him uh, well aware of when things get a little bit too hot for him. Sink and Mantecon Gutierrez, 1 hour 42.39. The benchmark time for now. Interesting to see how much that will come down. Whoops, just overshooting that a little figure out. And the Christian Heineck could uh, get the line a little bit uh, better. And, uh, Does affect closer. the rhythm a bit when you yeah, miss a, a turn like now. that. And uh, just the confidence, you're not quite in the flow. And uh, the 40k race, it uh, seems, like, um, seems like a long way, but uh, it's uh, quite short in relative terms with the year. Uh, Mountain bike stage racing, the marathon stages, the marathon style stages uh, going upwards of 100 kilometers, 112 kilometers. And 40k is short effort, but uh, just to keep that flow is really important. Keep the concentration, keep the morale up. If you make mistakes like that, it's, uh, it starts to erode the confidence. And uh, it's all about keeping a good rhythm, making sure that uh, nothing hits, nothing breaks your stride. Keep in the game. Ferraro and Aporo, Trek, Sala, Samarka. Remember this intense battle for third place on the uh, podium at the moment against uh, Ursuba and Simon Stevjan of the Bulls. 11 seconds at the start of the day. The early checkpoint suggested they told us that uh, Uber and Stevjan had made up more time on that. So they'd gone out to around 18 seconds on GC. But as this race unfolds, that may well change this pair. Oh, hungry to uh, get up into third place. We're looking at the time checks at the 30 kilometer mark, and that's uh, they've just passed that mark. In fact, uh, it's uh, Trek Salas and Marco Ferrara and Poro. And they're 52 seconds back on 7C CBZ Willia, that's Maya and Cataneo, with Crossbow lying in second at that section before the big teams come through at 48 seconds. So, Trek on a good day. Let's see how fast the Bulls go through at this, this time check. Porro and Ferraro. Well, they uh, have uh, been always in the mix. The Trek Santa and Marco team come to the Absa Cape Epic. There they are at uh, the 31.5 Ks and the third fastest. Maya and Gaetano, uh, the leaders at the moment. But as is, uh, we know, that'll all unfold and change as the faster teams come through. But uh, 52 seconds down so far. Porro and Ferraro.
Well, really no coincidence, those top two teams, uh, teams who are a little bit further back in the general classification, lost some time, maybe just taking it a little bit easier to conserve some energy and really concentrate on trying to win this time trial. Yeah, the cross spur team are interesting, as, as we've alluded to earlier, they've lost so much time, so they're uh, raiding on the stages every now and again, and they're probably earmarking one or two later on the week as well. Take a day off today's for, for many of them, uh, these top pros. I mean, it's uh, not even nine o'clock, and they're already showered and, re and rested. Although I must say, the 7C CBZ Williard team of Mehan and Cataneo, 10th overall at the moment, just 32 yeah. minutes off the overall lead, so really haven't been resting, so just credit to they them yeah. for a super ride today. I mean, when you're on a good day, you're on a good day and you're in contention. There's a good chance that they could improve. They start shooting up the leaderboard. We've seen some ominous moves, but Trek, Salas and Marco, the Bulls have moved up nicely. And this is another team we need to watch carefully. They're having a good day. They're not too, they're almost in touch with the top five, you could say, barring the, any kind of incidents with those top teams. And uh, we've got to be really watchful of uh, Maya and Cataneo. Well, they've got six minutes to make up on uh, La Carta and Plutz to take over the ninth place on general classification and we said earlier uh, La Carta and Platt were struggling a little bit further down the leaderboard these days and uh, the Abscape Epic to make a top 10 at the race is a big deal professionals train their entire lives just to make a top 10 so a creditable result for, for these two it's a very very deep field this year so many uh, top quality teams racing around the world come uh, and uh, shine a light on the Absa Cape Epic every year and use it as an opportunity to to uh, put their names in lights. That's a better four. He's also just slightly off both of them. Uh, Catching people by surprise yeah. that corner. It's one of it's sometimes as we said the innocuous corners, the tricky ones with the big arrows and the big skull and crossbones around the corner and down. They're the, they're the ones that people are careful of. It's the ones where there's no warning. It's just a little bit of a rut to the left and uh, before you know it you're in it. Watching here the uh, Trek Salas and Marco team. Just looking carefully at what the Bulls are doing. The Bulls have come through that time check. That's the 31.5 kilometer mark. The Bulls heroes are lying at 225. Just nine seconds back off Trek Salas and Marco. So still this is very much super steep section we saw earlier. Yeah. Uh, Matt Beers and Alan Hatterley on it. This gives you a really good angle at it to see how steep it is. It's incredibly difficult. And also important how you measure your efforts on that section. So just Make sure you're in the very easiest gear. Don't blow up the muscles. Put too much pressure through. The, just ease your way through it and then leave some power for uh, getting the speed back up on the flats. Well, there's the story then for our own Poro. Uh, nine seconds. Nine seconds. So uh, virtual uh, on GC, just two seconds is the gap now to Uber and uh, Steve John. They may as well be riding together. Even yeah. though they're riding apart, it is a time trial. Individual starts. They are absolutely matching each other, pedal stroke for pedal stroke, almost like someone's giving them time checks in the air all the time. Every pedal stroke does count on uh, today's time trial for these teams. So the uh, age groups, the uh, amateurs will be rolling off that start ramp and uh, for them, uh, for many of them, this will be a day of just get through it. We've got the maximum time allowed, time allowed is 4 hours and 15 minutes. I'd rather not spend all that time out there, uh, but uh, try and uh, just take it as easy as possible. Uh, we do have one team through the finish, one of the major teams, the big favorite teams to be watching. Split time at 31.5 yep. kilometers. Schurter and first to go to the top of the table. 123 faster than Meha and Cataneo. But uh, what we're really waiting for is the Cannondale team, Fumis and Avancini, to come through. And uh, just a couple of minutes, uh, three minutes, in fact, between the teams when they took off. So uh, not much longer to wait to get a split time. In fact, they were locked at the first intermediate for the no, top team, two teams on GC. Team that's just come in, MMR. Uh, factory racing they uh, just got to the finish they started really early and um, our cross spur team started before seven o'clock had a good run they'll have a bit of time on that hot seat but it looks likely they'll have that hot seat snatched away from them very soon when the next top contending teams come through so sh faster on the front here Schurter right on his wheel just body language suggests Foster is sticking really deep here. Yep. 
Our factory racing second fastest, David Valero is the Spanish champion. And uh, that's saying something with all the, the quality of the riders they've got. And uh, he's riding with uh, Cabral Andres Soto. So let's see if we can get images of uh, Schurter and Forster. Just to give you some perspective on uh, that first time check that we had. That same tricky that little same tricky that very well and it's just using where the road's been cut out they see that there's just that little bit of dirt yeah. on the left hand side they can use that as a, a berm yeah. just to get themselves onto the track That's so a good uh, sign using that, uh, every single centimeter and a good sign that foster is uh, is a little bit more alert than, than some of the other riders he was able to judge and correct so back through the gate and back into the oak valley estate and you can tell you'll see them go under that white sign the tracks are all yeah. named here so uh they're on their way now up towards the grunland falls and it's uh, really quite a steep and very sandy track on the way up to the falls and a, a short descent down through the uh the blue gum forest across the creek and straight back up the other side so it's a, a tricky and very difficult part of the course so we have some news from out in the course very exciting we have uh, at that time check, that's at the 31.5 kilometer mark. The first, the best team through that time check is Scott Sram Racing. And 41 seconds back, Cannondale Factory Racing. So that 40, well, a two minute 41 deficit that Scott Sram had is being eaten up. Now it's down to virtual lead two minutes on the road. Well, we did ask that question when they were deadlocked uh, on even time through the first time split after 13 kilometers. Had Cannondale gone out too hard? It's all about pacing yourself in a time trial. And we said in the, the longer stage, it was always Cannondale pushing the pace early. Scott Schramm sitting in tempo and then wind things up. And they're, they're the masters of pacing themselves in that tempo. And they've made their big attack now in this time trial. And uh, 42 seconds now, the difference in the space of 18 kilometers, they've built that up. So uh, really starting to make inroads on the GC lead of the Cannondale team. But it doesn't look like it's going to be enough at the end of today to take those yellow jerseys away. Yeah, with uh, some 12 kilometers to go, you feel there's no way uh, that these two will lose that sort of time without having go a major issue somewhere along the line. Uh, but th that lead will be shrunken by the time they get here. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Shirt, as uh, Robbie's been saying, is a master tactician. I mean, he's, he's uh, won cross country uh, World Cup races for almost a decade now from virtually every conceivable position. Um, he's been uh, had, had issues. He's fallen on the last lap and managed to get up and win races. So he he's, he knows exactly how to pace himself around here, and I think he's managing the last four step brilliantly. He he is, and that, that pacing is uh, really helpful. But the thing is that Nino Schurter is so strong. It's a credit to Lars Forster that he's able to go with that and ride at that pace. It's one thing to be guided in and say, this is how hard we need to go, but to be able to do it as well, quite incredible. It's a big aspect of the team if you've got the big responsibility of riding with the uh, seven-time world champion. You know you've got to live up to it. No one wants to let Nino down. And uh, Lars Forster is doing very well. Oh, there's a bit of a gap. That's not a good sign that they're not riding cohesively. Manuel Fumich either needs to get back on terms with, with Avancini or Avancini needs to drop back and just give his teammate a little bit of a chance not to put him under too much pressure pacing is everything yeah there's again we've seen this through the week and if it's just uh, being occasionally when it really the heat uh, gets wound up that he just uh, starts losing touch with his partner so we've got uh, a team in the hot seat. It's uh, the Cross Spur team. Let's hear from them with Laura. Guys, you were the fastest team here at the finish line and you started very early. So you overtook almost 10 teams. So how's been that? Yeah, I think we did a very good job today. Before the stage, we, we talked together that we will try to win this stage. It was uh, very good for us because we are cross country riders, then it was shorter, a lot of single trails and now we are faster, faster and we will see. <laughs> you had also, it was not easy because also you had a mechanical, so how long did it take that? Uh, I think we managed very fast, uh, maybe 15 seconds, 10 seconds and we continue that. We lost some, uh, some time, but I hope it will be enough. <laughs> Sergio, what do you think about the rivals? What do you expect from them today? 
Uh, for sure, it's one of the mini kind states because today's uh, team beat team, and uh, it's a very important day for the overall. So all the strong team will push as hard as, hard as possible. And the same for us is one of the, our goals, uh, the stage winning. And today we planning, Chinky and me, we planning to to go for the winning, and we will see what happens. And it was not easy for you because the conditions were not the same than now. It was uh, the light was different, so maybe that's also a factor. Yeah, it was one of our handicaps. Uh, we start one of the first teams, so we take some traffic in some single trials, and also the light at 6:51 in the morning <laughs> wasn't so good inside the forest. It was too dark, and we don't know the the track, so we have to improvise with not too much light. Uh, but in the other hand, we, we we had a very good feeling. We had good legs, and hopefully, we can get the winning. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, to uh, Sergio Manticon, Andre Sink, and uh, Laura getting up uh, dated from the uh, men in the hot seat, which is not far from us here. Just to give you some context on that uh, on that position on the hot seat, look at some of the the riders that have passed through the uh, the time checks. That is the 31 kilometer mark. Crossbow were fourth through that time check, and we've still got to wait for 7C, CBZ, Willia, Cannondale Factory Racing, and Scott Mountain Bike Racing to see how they do. Still three teams in contention that could knock them off that hot seat. Well, also think at that 31.5 kilometer time check, just going down through the GC a little bit, at the moment, Matthew Beers and Alan Hathley look to be about to, or they just have on GC leapfrogged over Peter Fogerhog and Christian Heineck. They were 42 seconds down at the start of the day. They're 50 seconds in front of them at the moment. So there's a, a lot of little races within the race. The, the third and fourth positions are very close to each other, seventh and eighth as well. So this uh, is on board with the uh, Bulls team, the Bulls heroes, Steve John. And uh, in front of them, Steve John and Uber, in front of them are the Scots Ram team, so they've ridden through them. Well, that means that, uh, that they've got a three minute advantage already because Nino Schurter and Lars Foster started the time trial three minutes behind the Bulls Heroes team, so they've made up that three minute uh, deficit already. And looks like they're on a storming day. A little bit humiliating for the Bulls, um, but they know that maybe today is not their day. Yep. Tomorrow is a day where they'll maybe come into their own. That short, sharp efforts are not really their thing. And also, they don't have yellow jersey to chase. New leaders in the hot seat, Louis Mayer and Johnny Catania of 7C CBZ Villier have posted a time of 1.41.03. Well, the Scott Sram team have just turned off the section they call the Grunland Steps. So they've gone up to the falls, had a dive back down, up the steps, and then along this piece of farm track, and then they'll swing in to the left and get a really nice piece of single trail. In fact, this is the piece of farm track that I nearly dropped oh, myself okay. on yesterday, and that's why I'm watching it with so much interest. Fast downhill, and I can tell you fellas, do not get on the left side <laughs> into that water rut. <laughs> well, is that, when, when a team there gets, it is, right yeah, there, there on the left. Okay. This is a very familiar trail to these riders as they head into the Land Rover technical terrain. Fissy's magic it is. Oh, the bulls will be section. You see this bank turn. They've got the wooden oh, the burn well, there. Tail it's a fantastic piece of trail. Both of them do a tail whip. I think they're... Um... Oh, that's a great burn there. There's no question. The uh, two men ahead of them made full use of that uh, lefty berm. And... Uh, Uber and Steve John, a little more conservative. This is a magic, really magical trial. It is Fissy's magic. Just notably, the Bulls are taking a lot of care not to get into the draft of the Scott Sram uh, racing team. Uh, they know that, uh, seen in the past, there have been some time penalties for drafting. They don't want to leave anything to chance. They want to leave a very respectable gap. You know the commissaires are watching every move. Well, I know one thing. They won't be able to see them from a heli shot through this section. It's really dense forest. It's really quite dark in there as well. You're really right under the trees next to the creek bed. It's a beautiful piece of trail. Which uh, tells us they are very close to home. Probably about 7 k's from home. Look at the trail there, snaking in and out of the forest. Well, this is that uh, yeah. last section they just came out of, the Grunland Steps. And then on the other side of the ravine is uh, where they come into this section. And of course, right at the top, the Grunland Falls. And you, you see this terrain, you don't really expect to see a waterfall, and then suddenly there it is. 
at the top of the ravine. Now May and Cataneo, they, they kicked um, Manticon Gutierrez and uh, sink off the hot seat. They're waiting. They're going to be looking very carefully at that board above the start arch. To that see was some decent air. Yeah, <laughs> yeah left yeah. and right, I think, as well. Nicely coordinated by uh, Mars Forster and uh, Nino Schurt. That was a little replay of the tail whips as they went over that little... They uh, know the cameras <laughs> are watching. Oh, Winning yeah. is fun. Yeah, absolutely. They love it. After all, that's why they're riding bikes. It's a passion for these uh, guys. It is a job as well, and they're doing that job very, very effectively. Lars Forster, the European champion and the world champion behind him. They're eating into that lead, 2 minutes and 41 seconds. At Canada Factory Racing had over them coming into the stage. They've chewed back for at least 41 seconds of that. And you feel the way they're going here, they may well be eating more of it. I have to think back to that fall that uh, Manuel Fumich had. Perhaps uh, that took a bit of a took a bit of the wind out of the sails. Uh, initially, maybe a bit of a burst of energy, and uh, suffering for that little those little efforts that um, that they put in. Well, the riders will recognise parts of today's course because the finish of stage two came in the same way, and you get to a point where on stage two you're one kilometre from the finish line. The course then swings right and takes you up an incredibly steep piece of farm track. So you, you feel, oh, I know where I am, I'm really close oh, to the finish, yeah. and then you turn back away from it again. So uh, some really tough sections still to come in this time trial. And do another loop out and around, away from the finish. Well, this is the hot team on the uh, course at the moment. Lars Foster and Nino Schurter. Big deficit uh, after yesterday, 6 minutes and 45, they lost on the day, 2.41 back in second place, having had the yellow jerseys after the prologue, they are looking to get a little bit closer to donning those once again, it probably won't happen today, but uh, they'll be a bit closer if they keep going like this. A little uphill section here, and we just caught a glimpse at the top of the ridge, that, uh, that solitary single file tree line. It'll dive down through there, the trail they call Indensity. And then on some nice single track again after that, which is where they can see the race village. And then they have to do another loop away from it. Now sitting on the tail of the uh, race leaders, Canada Factory Racing. Fumich on the front, now Vincini behind him. And uh, this is on Robbie's Nightmare. Yep. There they go, right past where I nearly ate it, and they are about to swing themselves into Vissi's Magic. I wonder if they've had a time check, and if, uh, well, they've got enough morale to uh, throw out a couple of tail whips, or if uh, the stress is starting to get to them, and it's all performance. Here we come go. down to that same spot, the big jump. Little, Little one. one. Avancini, well, a Brazilian. He's, he's got to. Little bit of show. Yes, he'll get through there. <laughs> it's a, that uh, left-hand berm is a beautiful piece of uh, trail as we've now back with Schurter and uh, Forster. We'll be following them through these trails, uh, coming in, the, the going into, into and out of the forest, and we expect to see them at the finish in around about 15 minutes. We're seeing some of the riders come in. We've seen Christoph Sauza come in with uh, Simon Andreasen. We've seen the Parga Eurosteel guys come in, and uh, the support team, the Scott Factory Racing DSV support team, also in, but the teams that really count in terms of what the results going to look like today, what the podium's going to look like today, they are still about 10 to 15 minutes out of the race village. It's a little bit on the brakes as they went into that left-hander and then opened the taps once again, Nino Schurter. And uh, Lars Forster, I reckon, I mean, he's done an incredible job, but... Uh, He's, he's riding with the very best in the business uh, for many, many years now. Olympic champion, world champion, and uh, World Cup champion. He's uh, going to be hanging on for as uh, much as he can. We've talked about Schurter. We've talked about Spitz actually having uh, all different colors of Olympic medals. You know Schurter has a bronze, a silver, and a gold medal too. Back with uh, the leading women. That's uh, Annika Langwell and uh, Anna van der Bregen. 
So, uh, yeah, we do. Casey, you're going to have some problems with our coverage out there. We're right against the slopes of the Grunenberg Mountains. So, Casey, the signal isn't great as we dip in and out of those valleys. But a drama unfolding here now with Nino Schurter and uh, Scott Schramm. They had 41 seconds. What do you reckon? Two, 241 at the start of the day. 41, they made up uh, already. What do you reckon by the end, uh, Robbie? I think they're going to manage to push it out to about a minute. Okay. Sets it up beautifully. I think Robbie stole my prediction there. I would say a minute's a very okay, accurate Okay, I'll time. say 59 <laughs> seconds. What do you reckon, Neil? 101. <laughs> All right, this is uh, back uh, where we want to be on the trails. This is uh, Father Bregan and Langville, Langville at the back at the moment. And uh, many have felt that uh, she's been incredibly powerful in all of her races and had great partners, Ariane Luti and uh, Kate Courtney last year. But Anna van der Breggen has brought uh, the best out of uh, Annika Langville this year. She is immensely strong and has proven to be a, a really able partner. And just such a great team network as well. They've got a great support team. This is a support team that have uh, supported the likes of Barry Stander and Christoph Sauser. We've got Yaroslav Kulhavi have won victories under this, uh, under this uh, structure and I think there was really little doubt as to, as to, fa as to the preparation and Anna van der Breggen slotted in, brought her A game, brought her power along and um, has fitted in pretty well. Just a time check, we went back to the talking about the women's, the, the first time check at the 13 kilometer mark, no surprises that Investec Songra specialized were best through that and at 38 seconds back a surprise, Summit Finn and crossbow racing at 1.30. So crossbow racing not on such a good day. They maybe spent a bit of energy chasing back yesterday. Look at the speed. These two are going shorter and faster. Flying down the trail now. They're closing in uh, on the last couple of kilometers. Amazing skills, speed judgment. Coming towards the end of the Sounds of Silence trail. And it's around this point where the other day they had just two kilometres to go. Well, now they still have about five to go. Yeah, this is uh, that sort of false finish, if you like. It's quite just a frustrating thing. You can hear this, you can hear the announcers, and you know you've just got a little bit to go. Not quite home yet. You may pass the finish, but uh, still a little bit of a loop to go. Make sure that. Uh, Good. Carefully watching the, uh, the kilometers on the computers, they all have very, uh, very close watch on exactly how far they've uh, still got to go. They'll have the profile boards stuck to their top tubes, keeping a very close watch on how many climbs to go, just so they can get there if it's perfectly measured. They do want to reach the finish with the tanks empty and not before, and certainly not after. Absolutely, they're putting everything on on the line here and uh, knowledge of what lies ahead is critical for them as well. Yes, Neil was su suggesting that. None of those A-frames. The e-bike there, capturing all the action. What's going on in front? Giving a bird's eye view, or a rider's eye view of what it's like on the trails at the Absa Cape Epic. Fumich and Aventini, yellow jerseys, this will if all goes well, still have them at the end of the day, but uh, not likely that uh, they're going to have as comfortable a lead as they had at the start of the day today. The tactics that these guys um, have, have started to, well, they're prepared with. The first thing that they're prepared with was the notion that Nino Schurter is unbreakable. They know that it's going to be really hard to break an athlete like that. So what they'll do is they'll focus their efforts on Lars Foster. So if there is any weakness in Lars Foster they see tomorrow, Canada factory racing guys will be capitalizing 100%. Yeah, capitalizing on uh, others' uh, mistakes and errors. And uh, the closer it gets, that tension between the two teams, and there's no question it's there. This is what has been one of the hallmarks of the first uh, few days of this race. There's uh, apparent tension between the two teams, more particularly between the cross country world champion and the marathon world champion, Churchill and Abitsini. It's a good thing. Fires up the race. It's a great thing for the race. and. As much as we don't want to wish mechanical failure on anyone or any team, it was also a good thing for the race that uh, there was the mechanical failure for Scott Ram. Let's face it, it's part of the racing and it's made it much more exciting. They had a, a big and comfortable lead. 
now they're on the back foot and they're on the chase and uh, it's now Avancini and, and Fumich who have to defend and, and are the, the hunted and uh, it just makes for fantastic viewing. It, but you cannot allow that sort of rivalry and that sort of tension to uh, override your approach to the to the race and i think that in a little way is what's been happening with avancini and uh, that nino shirt is seems to be the master of just shrugging it all off and uh moving moving forward he says it with a smile and it seems to be eating avancini a little bit more in, in my opinion well i think there's definitely a deliberate tactic to, to antagonize each other and avancini will be doing it as much as possible so when he goes on the podium he's going to make sure that that smile is extra broad beaming and make sure that uh, Nino Schurter is watching all of that. Yeah, I mean, you, that's exactly what we've seen on the podiums is, is uh, the different personalities and characters of the two. Nino's been the same every time he's been up there regardless. Avancini, uh, on, the, on the, uh, the day after the argument in, in Amanus was very grim. He didn't smile. And then yesterday he's up jumping and smiling. So Hard he, on his he, sleeve. He cannot Absolutely. hide his emotions one bit. Schurter and Foster. The uh, men who are looking likely to set the uh, quickest time today. Big, big effort to get that the Bucky running alongside the trail. That's a mobile grandstand. <laughs> cool. Hot house effect the, uh, coming up shortly and then they'll be uh, on the run into the finish. Yep, so they're over the top of that uh, very difficult farm trail climb, the really steep ones. So they're up and over the, well, what was the last hard piece of this course, straight ahead past the dams. And as you said, they'll come into a glasshouse effect, that last little run down. And there's a couple of little tricky sections on that descent. There's one of the right-hand corners. As you come in, it's a little bit unsighted. And there's a bit of a sinkhole on the left. If you go too wide in that corner, you'll find your front wheel go straight into that hole. And you can find yourself over the handlebars. And a little bit further down, there was one of the bridges that was just a bit collapsed on one side. Just see the skills of Schurter, the oh. way he just locks up that back wheel, kicks it out to the right, and it throws the bike back to the left, puts him in perfect line for the A-frame to go through the fence line. He's just brilliant to watch. That little section, sorry, Neil, just, just yeah, uh, Robbie, you've, you've, you've picked it perfectly, that, that section. At speed, down the hill, right hand, a little bit of a, a potential washout, but over the A-frame, all done as if uh, it's the easiest thing in the world. Yeah, it's rally style. You kick it out one side, yeah. and as it comes back, it puts you in perfect line, and then you just let it accelerate, and in this case, just let it off the brakes, and uh, you know, Schurter is just the master at... And it's not just the skills. I've seen other people do it, but not at this intensity. Yeah, that's you know, the thing, try yeah. and do that. Keep your concentration and keep those skills. When you're at a heart rate somewhere approaching 190 beats a minute, and you've already, you know, you're in four days of racing. And the idea of keeping your uh, keeping your skills honed, it's uh, it's so that really the those kind of moves will be completely instinctive. It's uh, it's something that you would be able to have um, just without even thinking about. He will have done that. It's part of his arsenal, part of something that he would just just do. And it's all part of being uh, in touch with your machine. His, his bike is set up meticulously. Crash. Whoa, oh, this Lung is trouble. of Van der Breggen. Van der Breggen, Van der Breggen I, think I think that is. Yeah. Struggling to get the bike out of the bushes there. Teammate waiting further up. In fact, that's, uh, that's Annika Langvall. Langvall. So she's just gone off the edge of the trail there. It's, uh... Wow, that's uh, the first little chink that we've seen in the armour of Investec Songo Specialised. Pushing hard as ever, as we always know they do. Well, on this section of trail, really steep drop-offs to the right. So all you have to do is just get a little bit offline, get that front wheel off the edge of the trail, and it falls away. It just seemed a bike was tangled in the trees as well. And you see how sandy and soft it is. It's really quite a, a difficult section, this, uh, this climb up on the edge of the cliffs, right near the top of the hills. Rungfall really has to watch out for us, not putting in too much effort to catch up. It's really up to her partner to drop back and uh, make sure that that two minute gap stays uh, stays under control and uh, they have such a great lead that it's still very easy to get caught up in the the spirit of racing and just try and push just a little bit too hard they've got a super comfortable margin they can relax still well they know they don't have to panic they've got a big yeah. buffer overall and uh you know leading in this time trial as well but uh, you know it's never far away a good thing for the investec songa specialized women's team is that it was on a part of the course that's not particularly fast uh, and it also was soft surface. It's quite sandy and that's probably why it happened in the first yeah. place. So there'll be no physical damage from that one. There's certainly no, not a lot of room for error on that trail. It's um, just one, 
30 centimeters to the left, 30 centimeters to the right, and uh, you're going to be off the trail, and uh, it can be very frustrating. You can saw the frustration of uh, Lanika Langfeld trying to get her back, bike back off that section, maybe caught on a tree, just uh, stuck between the water bottle cage, maybe, and the frame. And uh, she needs to be careful when she's in a situation like that, not to pull too hard in case something breaks off the bike. Just to put into perspective now, the uh, the benchmark time, 1 hour 41 minutes and 3 seconds. Johnny Catania and Louis Mayer. Samuel Samueli Poro and Damiano Ferraro, 59 seconds back. So uh, they are contenders, it, albeit they are marathon uh, races that, uh, out and out. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, where they are in GC after today because they had 11 seconds on uh, the Bulls. Well, at the 31.5 kilometre time check, we had Scott Schramm one and a half minutes ahead of Meja Catania. I don't think it's going to be stretched out to do, and here is the finish. Sensational wheelie really by uh, Lars Forster as he gets over the line. And guess what? One hour, 38 minutes and 40 seconds. They have smashed that previous best by two minutes and 23 seconds. New hot seat. So just finished saying that they were one and a half minutes ahead of the next fastest yeah. team at the 31 kilometer mark. They've put another almost a minute into them over the final 12 kilometers of this course. So it just shows the pacing, the intelligence, the, the race IQ of Nino Schurter and Lars Forster, the way they can wind it up and bring it all the way home and you know, made the biggest impact in the last part of the course. Well, it goes to show, although it's a very zen, a very zen philosophy, the slower you go on the first half means you're going to go faster on the second half, and that's uh, true as far as it goes, and certainly true of time trials. Inheriting the hot seat, kicking the other guys off, they are immediately. Uh, Nino makes himself very comfortable in that chair. Looks like uh, he he believes he's here, he's there to stay until uh, certainly until after the Camel Factory Racing guys come in. It's quite interesting to see the mountain bikers finish and they're quite content to just rack the bike, get off and sit down and don't want to go near it. But you see road riders finish the time trial, they're straight on the rollers, the warm down, thinking of the next day. Are these guys like, get me away from that thing, give me a break. Let's go down to Lara now and hear from uh, Scott Sram. Guys, 1.38 for you. Was this under your expectations this morning? Yeah, we did well, I think so. Uh, Lars was super strong today. Uh, he uh, pulled hard, and I think we even pulled out some time out of Cannondale, so it was a good performance there. How was the track, the route of these 40 kilometers, 43 kilometers? Uh, today was amazing, really. I had so much fun. The trails were so cool, so flowy, and a little bit crazy because in the fast, uh, in the Land Road Technical downhill, there were the trees were so close and we were so fast. Nearly hit some like three, four trees. But uh, yeah, had a lot of fun and fun is fast. It's nice, it's nice to hear that it's possible to suffer and also have fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's something in between, I would say. No, it was a, it was a good track. It was quite a loose surface, so it was uh, difficult. Some turns, uh, you always had to be afraid not to go too fast into the corners, but uh, yeah, we managed well. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's an understatement. They uh, managed extremely well. One hour, 38 minutes and 40 seconds. Just caught a glimpse there of, of uh, Canada Factory Racing. They are going to lose time today. Yeah, they were just oh, on mate. that section of a uh, glass house yeah. effect, the final descent down towards the finish. They will lose some time. They were 42 seconds down at the second time check, but we saw how Scott Schramm really brought it home and opened up a big gap on the, the second fastest team here at the finish at the moment. And will that be the same story for Cannondale Factory Racing? And we're thinking about a minute, but hard to say this last part of the course, so brutal with that very steep climb in the last three kilometres. That battle for the third place on the podium has changed again. The Bulls and Steve John 24 seconds behind uh, Trek and Marco. So the Italians will move above them in the GC by uh, about 13 seconds. So it's going to be a, a game. And then tomorrow, perhaps a day that plays in the Bulls' hands. A it's a signif battle. significant show of strength there between the two of them. They're going to be watching each other's times and even the split times very carefully. Probably won't read too much into the uh, time difference. They I know they're more or less evenly matched. And it all will come down to what happens and how they measure their efforts over the next three days. Having a look at that uh, interview, just thinking about it, uh, how, how quickly did Nino Schurter point out that Lars Foster was strong? Yeah. Maybe there's something at play there because we all, all know that the, the, uh, 
the competing teams are looking very carefully at the uh, second rider, you could say. They're looking at how well Last Foster is doing. Everyone knows Nino Schurter is unbreakable. The other teams are looking at how breakable Last Foster is. Nino, very quick to point out that Last Foster was strong. Are, are, you, in, are you intimating that uh, he is trying to uh, mask the potential weakness in his team? Let's pay attention carefully to that because oh, we, we have Cannondale Factory Racing coming in and uh, I haven't seen you looking back. He's not making any secrets of the fact that Manuel Fumich is the weaker partner. Let's see if he says anything about Manuel when they get to the finish. Avoiding eye contact with Nino Schota, not even looking in that direction, racking the bikes, facing the opposite way. One minute and 28 seconds, uh, Avancini and uh, Lars Forster have given over to the Scott Sram team. There it is, 128. They are second fastest on the day. So well, that's, that, uh, that's in line with what they lost fairly, between yeah. check one and check two. They were dead level at the first intermediate time check at 13. At 31, they were 42 seconds behind. Then they've gone and lost a further 46 in that last section. So uh, Nino and Lars just went further and further away. So 128, they've lost about half oh, of their yeah. lead that they started this morning with on GC. One thing about the time trial is that uh, there's no one with you, there's no way to match a pace. And uh, really gives Nino Schurter and Lars Foster, gave them a good opportunity to just open up as much of a gap as they can. They pace themselves absolutely perfectly as the record shows haven't seen in Fumich. very so interesting you're referring to the dynamic in this winter enclosure and uh, Schurter and uh, Forster sitting in the shade on their red hot seat there they're comfortable they're uh, chatting and laughing and uh, there's very definitely another camp going on there the Canada factory racing one not even as uh, Niels they're looking at each other yeah very different vibe I mean uh the Cannondale factory racing team are, are there in their yellow jerseys. They have defended the lead uh, adequately to hang on to that. But uh, not too many smiles over there. Sort of heads down a little bit uh, like they've taken a kick. Uh, they've got up now a little fist pumps. Uh, uh, we're seeing uh, behind us here. We're in the position to look straight into this uh, enclosure. There was a quick fist pump and then the, they left. So Fumich and Avancini second thus far on the stage they've lost a minute and 28 of their overall lead which is uh, 241. well we saw Schurter and uh, Forster go go over yep. to the Cannondale team to you know give the fist bump say well done but it's almost a, a we won and we're coming to get you see you tomorrow yeah race on that's for sure it's getting down to one of the closest uh, at this stage of the Absa Cape Epic that we've seen in many, many years. And the big uh, psychological battle between uh, Enrique Avancini and Nino Schurte isn't necessarily the battle between the two of them. Perhaps right. it's to antagonize uh, them so they hurt their partners. Laura, it's all yours. It's here for them. Hi. <laughs> Manuel, we go with you that you are sitting down here. Second of today's stage, only two seconds behind uh, Tim Scott. How? Two seconds. Yes. Two seconds? Yes. Sure. Yeah, 138, 140. At least what's where, what least we've so seen. Let <laughs> <laughs> me ask a question, okay? How was your day so far? No. <laughs> but listen, so what do you think about it? No, I mean, we had a we had a okay race. I mean, we had a different approach. We wanted to not lose too much time, and in the end, I think it was over one and a half minutes. But um, we had a little, or I had a little issue. I had a crash, or I washed out, uh, and uh, after three k's already, and then I broke my suspension uh, lockout. So I was riding more or less 40 k's with complete uh, locked suspension, and at one point, my back just uh, blocked more or less, and then <clears throat> we couldn't really work together in a way so Harvey had to do most of the work today so he was really strong I couldn't really help him today he kind of took me on the hook and brought me to the finish so in the end I'm really happy with our team uh, tactics and man we had a we had a different approach but it worked out and we're happy with the second place we kept on yellow and it's all right I'm glad that you have more information than I have <laughs> so how are you gonna face the race from now on so as Manny said you know today we actually planned to ride way more aggressive than we did, uh, but he had like a small crash early on the stage, and then he, he got a small mechanical issue. 
So we, we tried to to balance the situation. Uh, we lost more time than we wished to. Actually, the plan was to at least keep the time or put some some seconds on the Scott guys. Uh, anyway, we just adapted to the situation. We're still in yellow. We finished second on the stage, so we kind of controlled the damage, I would say. And uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, we have like three days to go. And uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, I didn't spend too much energy as I would today. So probably for the next three days, I'm going to have like three uh, uh, good legs still. Thank you. So the views uh, from Manuel Fumich and Henri Cavancini. And uh, these are our race leaders in the women's, seemingly recovered from uh, that off Annika Langval and Anna van der Breggen, just tapping out a steady rhythm here. Yeah, I just noticed another little slip there for uh, Annika Langval. So they're just a little bit ginger around this course now. It just takes one little slip, one little crash to change your mindset to the course and uh, how tentatively you ride. And when you start to ride tentatively, you just seem to make more mistakes. Well, they came up with the uh, phrase themselves, uh, it was uh, fast but safe. And uh, perhaps not sticking to that, it, uh, it's a psychological tactic that the riders play with themselves and with others is to keep repeating and keep visualizing exactly how they need to go, how they need to ride. And fast and safe is a good catchphrase, but uh, Annika Langfall made a bit of a mistake there. Perhaps she was pushing too hard. And also from the way that she pulled that bike out of the bush, a little bit of desperation and uh, also sprinting to catch up. Not necessary, but in the heat of battle, it does, play, uh, it does play a role, that sense of urgency when you do fall off. I see out of the corners, uh, Langval re-accelerates and the gap opens up to Anna van der Breggen and then she just pedals her way back across that gap and back onto the wheel of the Super Dane world marathon champion and then as it gets technical again one little corner and the gap opens up again straight to Anna van der Breggen I think van der Breggen more comfortable on the big open long courses rather than something that's very technical or much more technical like this time trial course around the Oak Valley estate certainly the learning curve of Anna van der Breggen has been pretty steep she's enjoying herself now we did hear earlier say that she's uh, looking forward to this the fun single tracks and uh, that's she's certainly embracing mountain biking 100%. There we have it. Uh, look at our GC standings. These are before every team has come in, but uh, we're pretty much there. Fumich and Avancini now down to 1 minute and 13 seconds, their advantage over Schurter and Foster. Ferrara and Porra now jump up into third place ahead of Uber and Steve John, but still desperately close there. And guess my guess and Hathley and Beers also involved in a terrific tussle. Yeah, they've jumped their way all yeah. the way up to sixth, Hathley and Beers starting the day down in eighth position. So a really good ride from those two, especially considering that uh, Matthew Beers had that heavy crash yesterday and opened up that right hip and his right arm. And uh, that's a great ride from those two. This is their sort of day, uh, Hathley and Beers. Uh, the terrain, the, the, the type of riding. But uh, Schurter and Forster, they'll take great confidence out of that. It took a minute 28 in the time trial and more than halved the gap to the leaders, Fumich and Avancini in GC. So they're really breathing back down their necks. And a minute 13, oh, you get on one of these steep climbs, a minute 13 is it's 150 metres. Yeah. It's, it's uh, just perfectly set up for the Queen stage tomorrow stage five when we go to Stellenbosch uh, some big climbs and of course that portage down the Hunter Pass which uh, is going to be vitally important they've got to jump off their bikes carry them run the cr cyclocross style down the rocks down the down the trail and it's not an insignificant distance it's a world heritage site and there is no riding allowed down there to be able to see if you we catch a good look at the uh, wagon trail tracks you can actually see where the wagon trails were dragged up the big cuts in the rock it's a really technical section technical to run down and we probably will see some of the riders run down, certainly if there's a gap. Uh, maybe there'll be a truce, who knows? If there's a truce, you'll see some of the riders are walking down, taking it easy, and then the racing will start after. But uh, knowing these top teams, especially the rivalry that's been developing between Scottsram and Cannondale, it's unlikely. Yeah, tomorrow is a really tough stage. 100Ks, 2,850 meters of climbing and uh, a uh, five chain ring day it is the uh, designated as the queen stage tomorrow we also got the hot spot really early on uh, there's some there's a, a climb at uh, the seven kilometer mark it's a concrete strips climb and the hot spots is uh what two climbs after that so lots of climbing in the early stages of the race 
and that hotspot will cause a split in the race no doubt there'll be a bit of a regrouping at the water point then it's up to the top of Hantu Pass racing is bound to explode at that point incredibly uh, stark pictures of uh, the terrain here after the fires and it's very recent so a lot of these bridges that run there have been rebuilt as Anna van der Breggen and Annika Langfeld illustrate just how steep this is well, you see those new bridges and also those concrete strips that yeah. they've uh, built into the ground and these uphill turns are really very steep. Well, it's got the concrete strips on them, otherwise you just get no traction. It's really quite a sandy soil up through this area and they're climbing their way up now towards the Grunland Falls. So top of this section, they'll get just underneath the falls, take a left back down through the Blue Gums and then across another new bridge before they start on the Grunland Steps out and away from this section, which will bring them into the last five kilometers of the stage. The last five, five kilometers of the stage means that they have passed that 31 and a half kilometer mark and Vestek Songa specialized, having a minute and a half over their nearest rivals, Summit Finn, and almost three minutes over Crossbow Racing. The battle for second spot between Summit Finn and Crossbow Racing is definitely swinging in Summit Finn's favor, having gained over a minute and a half Candice Lowell, Adal Marath have gained a minute and a half on Ariane Luti and Maya Wojciechowska. And it's quite surprising to see that uh, Candice and uh, Adele have been able to put a minute and a half into Maya and Ariana. We, we thought maybe that would go the other way today. Uh, yesterday, Maya and Ariana had, of course, that uh, pretty, pretty bad uh, mechanical issue for them. They had to change a wheel, then they got one that was no good anyway. And, uh, oh, feet out of the pedal. It's just... They're very, very tight turns and quite sandy and uh, you know, your technical skills need to be right spot on to get through there. And it's Anna van der Breggen who seems just, just is struggling with those more te technical sections. Really tricky. She's back and going pretty quick. Tricky section, yes, and it needs a little bit of experience, a little bit of measured effort to get around these hairpin bends and anyone can make mistakes. We saw, uh, we saw uh, Nika Langfall make a mistake on some of the narrow single track and anything can happen. Both riders need to be super careful to preserve that lead. I'll come clean, I did exactly the same thing there yesterday. I got <laughs> through that corner and you just, my front wheel went away in the sand and as it turned sideways, you just got nowhere to go and your foot out of the pedal. So I did exactly what Anna van der Breggen just did. So I've got to say, it's an incredibly difficult section. Very difficult. Maybe the most difficult section of the entire Absa Cape <laughs> There again, just rolling onto the uh, edge of the trail. And there are those strips to aid traction on the very steepest sections of this very sta sandy trail. Just the subtle techniques of navigating their way up. They'll be uh, looking to drift into that uh, concrete section and use as much power as they can. Even though the concrete strips are a couple of meters long, they'll put down maximum power to give themselves just a little bit of extra momentum where the, just so they have that momentum over the really sandy sections where they might not have quite so much grip. Here you can see how sandy it is and also quite a lot of ash there from the recent fires as well. So just uh, making it a very, very loose surface. You know, see how hard they're working, shifting the weight left and right on the saddle just to keep the bike lined up and on the track. We're looking back here. This is uh, Annika Langfall. So that means that it was Annika Langfall that maybe made that mistake on that, uh, on that corner. Could I be right? Happens to the best. So this Makes is... Makes me feel even better. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, just sensational, isn't it? Sitting on the wheel of these... Uh, top riders in the world. Well here we are, Grunland Falls. You just look up to the right, you might catch a glimpse. And that's a very steep, sharp left-hander which starts to drop them back downhill here through the gum trees. And uh, that made me feel right at home in Australia riding through yes, here. Yes, I'm sure you do, yeah. A rewarding part of the trail, super engaging. Riders from uh, Cape Town and uh, the surrounds enjoy these trails every single weekend. Some very nice hairpins on the way down here. There's the first one on this trail. Three or four more, and then they swing hard right and across a bridge, across that ravine, and then start to step their way up the Grunland steps. And the hairpins there are, are really cut out perfectly for riding uphill, very flat in the beginning, and then kick up out of the corners. That's the image of Teresa Ralph and her partner Sarah Hill, the new wearers of the Absa African Women's Leaders jerseys after the uh, sad withdrawal yesterday of Amy McDougall and Sam Sanders. Amy struggling with uh, uh, illness and not being able to complete the stage, so very sad. There's a virus going around and they uh, 
absolutely any Beth said she just couldn't put out a single watt we saw her run about the 15 kilometer mark getting a push back into the group uh, very early stages in the race it was all together and from then on it was absolutely lights out and just retired had to had to pull out after 22 kilometers isn't this a strange old thing it was uh, uh, Teresa Ralph and Sarah Hill who were what was inconsolable after copping a uh, half hour time penalty for uh, drafting on the prologue and now they are leading the category that they were targeting anyway so uh, they've got the jerseys on their backs long way to go though still certainly a comfortable lead yes but anything can happen well there look over the beautiful Elgin Chabo Valley as we uh, flick back to uh, the riders making their way up this Single track. I think that's Bart Brenchens and Abra Azevedo. It is. Yeah. So you can tell Bart yeah. Brenchens from a mile yeah. away, that distinctive uh, rib cage of his. It's, uh, he must have uh, 12 litre lungs packed into there. It and looks like he's wearing a camelback, but it's just, uh, I think, developed over time with yeah. Bart Brenchens so much on the bike. and uh, It's an old school yeah, rider. He's spot him a mile off. And he's riding a hardtail. One of the very few riders to ride a hotel. Most people uh, decide to opt to for the full suspension, just the, uh, the not only the, the, the absorption that you get out of it, but also the traction and the ability to control the bike. But Bart's a hard man, rides a hard tail. Yeah, I haven't seen many. And actually, uh, Alessandro Pitaki and Francesco Kiki are also riding on hard tail bikes from their sponsor. Avra Azevedo from Brazil on the frontier and uh, Bart Brenchens. They're leading the Grand Masters category by nearly 40 minutes, so they've got a very handy lead in that category. No problem at all for them. At Summit Finn, we can see Candice Lil leading Adel Morath. Adel Morath on the pink bike. So they're on a good day. Some of the time checks, they're a minute and a half. They will be watching behind them. There's a chance that they will be caught by the Investex Songo Specialized pair, so it's the last thing they want. They don't want the... Uh, the la the blow to their morale have been caught out on the course. Well, I think their morale will be getting even better as time goes on because they may have expected to get caught earlier mm. by such a dominant team of Van der Breggen and Langval. Uh, and I wonder if they already know that they've put a minute and a half into Maya. Uh, look at the riders there, the locals that come out to support the riders on the trail here as the day progresses. A little bit of air from both our riders. The but no tail whip. And it, no no tail whips. Either. Will they use the wood? No. Uh, staying safe and on the inside on the dirt. Safe and fast. No time for show. No. And as the day progresses, uh, the uh, vibe out of the course and here at the finish will uh, intensify because uh, the amateurs are heading out here. And a great day for their families to come and watch them. There's a guy you know quite well. Rodriguez and Hamida. Well, that's Purito Rodriguez uh, in second wheel, following his teammate, the more experienced. I'll say, uh, in fact, it's the other way it's round. Exactly yeah, that's round Purito on the front on the climbs. It's Hermida who guides him in on the downhills, and uh, Purito actually the stronger climber on the steep climbs. Uh, Jose Hermida was telling us. And they are the uh, similarly dominant as uh, Brenchens and Azevedo and the Dimension Data Masters Act leading this by a country mile. Uh, and little surprise as well because uh, Hamida, a former world champion not too long ago and a serial stage winner at this event, perhaps many consider one of the, uh, one of the, the best riders not to have won this race. But when he came out here, he wasn't really targeting the win here. He was still a serious cross-country racer. and. Uh, the race was a little bit different in those days, perhaps suited the marathon riders a little more, so he would target a stage, usually the grand finale, as befits his uh, personality. And normally the, t the stages he targeted, he won. Yep. And uh, in the 80 years, he was uh, aware of the yellow jersey, he wore the yellow jersey twice. Yep. Unfortunately, uh, he, he, without the backup team aspect, he did lose it, and they had a mechanical one of the days, and uh, another of those, he seemed to pick up some kind of an allergy, and literally got off the bike and could not carry on. Fortunately, did was able to continue, but uh, yellow jersey was um, that was out of the window, and that was the year that uh, Christian Heineck and Robert Menon, a big year of a year of big surprises. Well, Hermida and Rodriguez they're leading uh, the Masters division by quite a long way over Decker and Chalingi, but they would also would be running on on their time currently. They would be running within the top 30 in the elite men's division, anyway. Sabine Spitz and Aideen Reader there in the white kit there, the uh, pair of the Mirandol Viavis uh, Rotfeld team. They 
have Sarah Hill and uh, Teresa Ralph just behind them and in front of them the fair tree silverback pair of Jenny Stenehach and uh, Mariska Strauss who've written through this lot because uh, they started uh, behind them so these are some of the right major contenders in the women's field with Annika Langfall and Anna van der Breggen way up the uh, race. There's uh, some intense racing further down for podium positions. Sarah Hill will lead on these sort of sections. She's a very skilled descendant, has raced downhill, and a good cross-country racer. Teresa Ralph is unashamedly a marathon uh, racer. That's her strength and her passion. Well, Sabine Spitz has done it all. All three Olympic medals to her name. And there's our race village there in the distance, top of the picture there, yeah. in the middle. Well, the fact that Galileo Risco behind uh, the, uh, the Mirandal team means that they were caught, they've been caught and passed on the course by Sabine Spitz. It was a three minute start advantage. Uh, Galileo Risk and Sabine Spitz and Nadine Reader have made that up. Notably uh, how carefully they've left the gap there. This team have been penalized. They've penalized half hour after the after the, the prologue, they were uh, seen to be drafting the team. It was the decision of the commissaire to dock them half hour. Very careful to leave a gap today. Well, uh, Sabine Spitz so experienced that she uh, has come here with a young partner. She's done that before, and uh, they've gridden themselves in. There you go, five kilometers to go, yeah. and this is one of the most fun parts of the course through this forest, really flowing smooth track. So all the riders, they're, they're really loving this last five kilometers of the course it is just so nice to ride and uh yeah they're out there having a lot of fun absolutely that's what it's about why we ride our bikes uh, robbie why did you start riding a bike purely for fun and yeah. that's how i did it all the way through I had a couple of days in there that weren't as fun yeah but uh for, for most that's what it's what it's all about and you still ride and i think that uh, you know there are a lot of uh, former professional sportsmen in various other sports who put down their kit and never touch it again um cyclists never stop riding. No, once a rider, always yeah. a rider. And you know, when you've been involved in maybe a team sport like rugby, well, it was pretty hard to go. Yeah, yeah. You, get, you got your boots on, you got your ball, and then, okay, where is everyone? I've got to organize the game. And you know, they can hardly walk anymore after they've yeah. uh, had a, a long career. So, you know, cycling is just one of those things, a, a great thing to do in a group or on your own. Get out on the trails, have fun, go for a road ride, and it, it's brilliant. And still the competitive edge, we've seen some of the road riders in the Masters category and still want to still they still have that uh, that nose for a bit of a competition and uh, fighting it out with uh, Jose Hamida and Perita Rodriguez. Maya Wojtowska on the front here for the cross spur racing uh, team Ariane Luti behind her lost copious amounts of time yesterday looking to make up some of that to get back uh, right into uh, the uh, competitive edge of the the field 29 minutes I think was their gap back to the overall leaders and again, a combination of a out-and-out cross-country race, although Maya has ridden uh, marathons, but she's uh, still very competitive at the uh, highest level of the World Cup circuit. And Ariane uh, Luti, who has dipped her toes into the World Cup uh, arena every now and again, but uh, this is her, her domain. What I love about this pairing is no matter what happens, they come in and tell their story with a smile on their face. They love it. And we're talking about it. it's, it's just fun. People ride the bike for fun, and no matter what happens, they, they take the good with the bad and come in smiling. So this is Team Summit Twin, and again, Candace looking over her shoulder. She's done a lot of that in the last four or five Ks. Clearly, Adelaide is on a bit of a rough day today, and Candace is feeling super strong. Well, she's going quite well because they have yeah. closed in a minute and a half uh, of the original gap at the start that they had behind uh, Ariana Meyer. So uh, they're doing a great ride, these two, and yeah, surely it is really starting to hurt Adele. Yeah, Candace, so smooth, the former bronze medalist in the World Cup and the World Championships. Who is good again? I think uh, this is uh, Thomas Fischnick. Yeah, Thomas and Urs teamed up last year already in the Grand Masters and back again for a bit more punishment. I had a chat to Urs yesterday and he said he's just loving it. He's a, another guy who's just always got a smile on his face. He's just glad to be out there and teamed up with a legend of the sport in Thomas Fischneck. Legend of the Six. sport, uh, many time uh, world champion and also the founder of the Swiss Epic. So he's got a, he's, he's ironing a few fires 
uh, but didn't want to miss uh, his chance to come out and enjoy the Western Cape on a mountain bike. Well, also running the team. He's the, the, the team boss of uh, Nino Schurter and Lars Furster. Also looking after his own son, Andre Frischneck, who changed teams, started the week right before the race started, and uh, they made the decision that Furster should team up with Nino, and it looks like it's been the perfect decision. Back with uh, our women's leaders after having a look at the Dimension Data Masters there. That strapped knee tells us that's Anna van der Breggen on the front there. Slightly different demands on her body as uh, would have been on the on the road bike, yeah. Set up yeah. bike set up absolutely crucial. Yep, yeah, very different sort of bike, a different pedaling action. You don't have that same completely smooth pedaling action and there's big changes in intensity to punch over those little technical sections, those steep parts or you know, ride your way out of a, a situation in the sand. So a lot more different demands on the body, not to mention just the roughness of the yeah. track. And it was actually interesting the other day to hear Annika come in and say, I can't feel my hands and my arms, they're killing me, it was so rough. And Anna said, I feel okay. <laughs> so obviously her technique is really quite good. We've seen her struggle a couple of times, but overall, she's just such a versatile rider. That's Part of being safe. a professional is adapting to your environment, and if it means uh, racing on the cobblestones, you need to learn how to do that. And some riders just are that talented, they can adapt to anything. Well, that does translate very well to the mountain bike. If you can ride well on the cobbles, it's that letting the bike flow, not gripping it too tight. You don't want to strangle the handlebars. You just let everything ride a little bit and not grip it too tight. And uh, at the end of the week, that uh, saves you a whole lot of fatigue. This is where the course uh, really gets very close. You can see the riders making their way up that initial climb up uh, at the start. There's a amateurs and uh, age group is leaving and this is uh, the drop down to the finish. Well still a huge line up here at the start of teams uh, ready to make yeah. their way out onto the course. So it's going to be an all day affair. Our first teams went off at 6.45 this morning. Uh, they're going to be heading out for a couple of hours yet. And of course a, a four hour 15 minute limit on completing the course. Six, that is the cutoff of the day. Yeah, 650 teams starting the uh, ride. We've Probably 50 of those are no longer complete. In other words, one rider has uh, dropped out uh, for one reason or another, and uh, the other has continued on and may continue on wearing a, using a blue number. No official finish, although uh, you can show that blue number off uh, at the end at Val de Vie if you get there with it and say, well, I did finish the Absa Cape Epic. But uh, that's the lion's share of this event, is the amateur rider as we look at the professionals now. Fana Bregan leads over that little uh, style and into this uh, beautiful flowing single track that will take them closer to home. Yep, back into the sounds of silence as they're only around two and a half, three kilometres to go now and this will be a, a trail they recognise well. They've ridden it a couple of times now on stage two. This was uh, only around a kilometre and a half to go but as we said earlier they get within a distance they can smell the village, they can smell the barbecue here at the finish line and then they turn right and go back away up a really steep farm track around the top of the dam and then make their way back down to the finish down the glasshouse effect descent. Which they won't mind too much today, that little extra loop, uh, because they know they've got uh, a really short day. These riders will be uh, home and hosed by about 10.30. Well, it's completely home and hosed by 10.30. They'll be home a little bit earlier than that. And uh, they've got a long day to recover and uh, rest and uh, sleep if needs be, have the massage. Have a good meal and prepare for tomorrow's big day. Yeah, it's a, a semi-recovery day and for those who are not riding for general classification, they can really afford to just cruise through it, save the legs as much as possible and uh, think about tomorrow's difficult stage to Stellenbosch because it is a five-star stage. 100 kilometres, 2,850 metres of climbing tomorrow. So that'll be in the back of the mind of many a team going out on this time trial. They'll be looking to take it as easy as possible. Look at this uh, pace being uh, dished out by Anna van der Breggen and uh, Annika Langfall. They've uh, sensed home now and they are absolutely powering through. I think this is something, the, a whole new dimension for Annika Langval. We've seen her in past editions. She's been the dominator, the one driving the team, forcing the pace, nursing her teammate, but hurting them. But this time, it's Anna doing a lot of the pacemaking. Annika seems like she is on her limit.
Absolutely. Just up that little turn there, that little guy. Yeah. Anna just rode up there, no problem. Annika was out of her saddle. I've got to get back up there. We've seen on the first days, it's the skills of Annika who's been sort of gapping off Anna a little bit. But as fatigue sets in, that acceleration isn't quite there anymore. And it seems Anna is really coming into her own as a stage race rider. And you know, she is such a fantastic pro on the road. And the, that physiology, she's just translating that straight onto the mountain bike. And we saw the body language at the finish and the interviews. Uh, Anna van der Breggen was standing up and uh, just quite stoically saying how it was. And I think Langfall sitting down and really struggling uh, a little bit out of breath, perhaps. And we did hear a little bit of a maybe gave away too much where uh, Anna van der Breggen said that, uh, yes, Annika had a better day today, meaning that uh, the last uh, or the previous few days were not quite uh, going according to plan in terms of the physical output. Yeah, well you do get that and uh, that's what makes this team racing so intriguing. One will have a good day, the other will be on a bad day, but if you both have a good day at the same time, it's exactly what you need and make an all-out assault on the overall. But it's, uh, it's often just a balancing act of uh, nursing the weaker because they might be the stronger tomorrow and you can't afford to go and punish your teammate because when you're on a bad day and they're on a good one, if uh, things start to fall apart within the team, then they'll put the hurt on. We've seen it before and it's it's really not the way to ride a team no, race, no. but it does happen. And they know it and the, the rivals know it and the, the little rivalry that's going on, rather the big rivalry that's going on between uh, Enrico Vincini and Nino Schurter. Uh, they are acutely both aware that, uh, that if they rile each other up, they could uh, end up breaking their partners and that's really what they're aiming for. Well, we sit behind Mariska Strauss and uh, Jenny Stenerhaag. A good steady effort from these two. They were fourth at the at the uh, 31 and a half kilometer mark at three minutes 20 off Investec Songo Specialized. Notably, only 22 seconds off Crossbow Racing. So they're on a good day if they're matching the likes of uh, Ariane Luti and Maya Wojtowska. Just a reminder of our leading time today. Last faster, Nino Schurter, one hour 38 minutes and 40 seconds. Two, uh, one minute and 28 seconds back. Henri Cavancini and Manuel Fuich of Canada Factory Racing. Louis Mayer and Johnny Catania will be on the podium today, two minutes and 23 seconds down for Wulia. And Wojtowska and Luti chipping away at uh, the deficit second until yesterday on the GC. And they're going to be uh, looking towards tomorrow for a better day. Today it really was, didn't seem like it was their day. Losing time to Summit Finn, they having lost over a minute and a half already at the 31 kilometer mark let's try and work out at the finish we're going to see some finish interviews we're going to try and decipher exactly what's going on in that team Ariane Luti looks to be taking the back uh, seat on that um, on that flat section looks like Maya is the stronger partner today certainly well they are six minutes behind Candice Hill and Adelaide Morath going into uh, today's stage so if they can uh, try and eat back that, but we know Lil and Morat look to be on a really, really good day. day. In, the, in this climb here, talking of the dominant partner and the, uh, and the, the partner who's just not quite as uh, strong as, as, as the other, it seems like Anna Van Abregen is uh, the stronger rider today. She's been setting the pace on the flat section, setting the pace on the climb, and even on the single track she's been in the lead. So interesting to see the body language again, try and work out exactly what's going on in that team dynamic. They'll head up this hill, go round the dam on the edge of that dam and then drop down into the final little sector, the hothouse effect. Well, we might be able to follow them uh, with that uh, midi e-bike, the bull's e-bike. But a slow drag up here. It's been a monstrous effort again from Annika Langville and Anna van der Breggen. They ride for the same trade team on the road. They have done for the start of this year. Annika only signed with them late last year with the eye of doing a few uh, road races early this year because the World Cup season only starts uh, in uh, May, so there's plenty of time for her to, uh, to get some uh, racing in. And certainly you wouldn't want to sacrifice an athlete like that. The specialized factory racing team, no doubt being the driving force behind the, the lending and the borrowing. Being on that trade team, the Bill Stormans team, it's uh, the best, one of the, you could say, arguably say they're one of the best teams in the world. And uh, to have the talents, the likes of uh, Annika Langfeld, worth it. she's paid off, she's already paid her paid herself her salary with a fantastic performance in the Strada Bianchi coming second with powering up that last climb amazing to see only perhaps the other woman regarded as the next best rider in the world at the moment Annie van Vluten uh, 
beat her there. So, yeah, some serious talent here. Heading down towards the hot house effect. And this is the leading team, the last women's team uh, to leave this morning. Candice Lill and Adelaide Morath should be making their way into the finish very, very shortly. Melissa Strauss and Jenny Steenhaag across the line. Two hours and six minutes for their time trial. And our leaders, you can see them there. Oh, a few metres apart down uh, Glasshouse Effect. It's just about to go over the big tree in one of the corners. Oh, there they are. Silverback uh, Fair Tree in, Strauss and uh, Stenach. And they're fairly pleased with what they've done today. And what's also notable is they have a good morale on the team. They know how important it is to keep um, keep positive. And uh, hey, we have uh, Nadine Reader. She's following Sabine Spitz into the finish. Good ride from them. Well, they come in at 2 minutes and 44 down on Mariska and Jenny. So the order across the line is at the moment the order on the time board. Of course, that uh, looks set to be smashed in a few moments' time when the... Investec Songo specialised team of Underbreggen and Langval come in. It's now Langval on the front. Looks like Galilea Risk are on their way in the uh, leaders in the All African Jersey competition. They're around about five minutes back off the pace, and Silverback Fair Tree goes straight to the hot seat. They're going to be sitting down, having a rest, and enjoying their moment in the sun. No doubt to be bumped off it by the coming teams. Well, third team across the line in the women's category, Sarah Hill and Teresa Ralph at 5 minutes and 18 seconds off fastest time so far of Strauss and Stenehaag. They're in the hot seat for now. Jenny Stenehaag and Mariska Strauss, 2 hours, 6 minutes and 26 ahead of Spitz and Rita, 2.43 down. And in pretty good spirits. It's, uh, well, you seldom see Mariska with anything other than a... I'm smiling a lot. Hey, enjoying the comfort of the hot seat rather yeah. than the collapsing onto the grass uh, yeah. here in the finish area. Making that uh, that excellent recovery shake. The tasty drinks that they're uh, that they're about to uh, guzzle down and um, all part of putting fuel back into the muscles, protein back into the muscles and uh, not wasting a moment to get that back into their bodies for tomorrow. Yeah. Wojtowska and Luti drilling at home for teams cross spur. They're home and uh, we'll get it out. Top, oh, of top of the table. Top of the table. Top of the table, yes. They're going to be bumping. No longer in the hot seat. Not long to sit in the hot seat. By 39 that seconds. That interview will have to wait. I'll have to see exactly how well the next few teams come in. Summit Finn still to arrive. They'll, they'll eke out as much of the shade as they possibly can, Jenny and Mariska, on what is becoming a really warm day after a chilly start here at Oak Valley. Beautiful weather today. Spectacular place to spend the day watching these uh, mountain bikers. Little stutter through that uh, tricky corner there for Van der Breggen. But again, Langfell having to make up the uh, small deficit. There's a 205.46, 39 seconds, the gap back to Stenach and Strauss. So Lutian and Wojtowska just trying to get back some of the time they've lost. Here's uh, Summit Finn, Lil and Morath. A really good day out for them. Is it good enough? It is. It top, is of the, yes. top of the time boards there. About two minutes? Yeah, two minutes, two seconds we've got on that uh, time board. So Team Crossbow Racing, it's a prestigious thing to sit in that hot seat, and they've kind of missed their chance because the, before they've even got into it, they've had to get up again. <laughs> yeah, they haven't even managed to get the seats. In fact, Mariska and Jenny still in there. This is our final pairing of Langval and Van der Breggen. They're within the last kilometer of this uh, Incredible prologue course. You should Incredibly see them within the technical. next minute or so coming in. Keep an eye on it. what that time is. Well, there we go. Exactly two minutes back to Luti and Vlostowska. So Lil and Morath, they will take over the hot seat. In fact, Ariana Maya didn't even get a chance to sit in it. And uh, if Lil and Morath aren't quick, then they won't get that a chance to sit themselves in. There they go. They're having said that, so they made sure. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> they want to have their moment of glory in the comfortable couch. Get the picture taken. Will we have time for an interview? I doubt it because uh, the leaders are making their way in and here they to are. the finish. Here they are. Here they are, our leaders, Annika Langval and Anna van der Breggen cross the line. And they cross the line. 
one forty four we've got. So one minute and forty four seconds at the gap. Yes. Well they are the stage winners then. In the women's elite uh, once again Investec Songo specialized dominating the time trial, but perhaps not by as much as uh, many might have thought, but certainly enough. Well, along the lines of what the, how they spoke yeah. before the start, they said, we, we do want to push, of course, and go for the stage win, but no huge risks, and we don't want to really burn ourselves up. They, had, you know, they, they know, like we do, that they're the dominant team. They can win this time trial, but they did it in, let's say, second gear. Yeah. They did say fast but safe, and we did see a little bit of uh, lack of coherence there. There was a bit of gapping going on. There was that uh, small op um, off of uh, Langfell having to drag her bike back out of the bush. Not quite as smooth as we've seen in the past. Well, maybe when you're not riding with uh, full intensity and just thinking, well, oh, we'll just ride a little bit in reserve, then also your concentration is very slightly lacking. You make a small mistake, and she just got her front wheel off the edge of the track and went down, but um, no damage done. Tell you what. The, the, one of the rides of the day must be Candazil and Adelaide Morat. They've really done uh, a brilliant job. Uh, minute and 44 against the preeminent team in the, in the race. The Summit Fin pair have ridden out of their socks today. Lutian Rostovska pulled back a bit of time, but uh, uh, Lil and uh, Morath still hold uh, the aces and have opened up uh, that lead by another two minutes uh, over Lutian Rostovska on the GC. We definitely expected more from the Crossbow Racing team. Uh, if you look at the results of the prologue, there was a flip of those results. Uh, Lutian Mostovsko was uh, certainly a lot quicker than, uh, than Lil Marath. And um, maybe this is a, a turn of events. This could be the pivotal time um, in the battle for second. So now let's uh, get down that hot seat has uh, had a lot of occupants, but uh, the ones who will have it for the rest of the day are in the seat now with Laura. Another top result for you, girls. How was it today? Um, <coughs> it was uh, <laughs> quite nice to have a short day, to be honest. Um, yeah, short day, more time for recovery for tomorrow. We got through today, kind of. Uh, on <laughs> yeah, we didn't want yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't stick to the plan. Sorry. It's, when she is in the race, yeah, and I have the same. If you're in the race, yeah. you. You want to go fast and yeah. What was the plan? <coughs> to do it steady and safe. Um, and I must say it was quite technical. At some single tracks, um, when you look down, I thought, hmm, better not do that. <laughs> um, but no, it was fun riding. It was a nice course today. And how, how was it for you? I think we saw you crash, possible? Yeah, it was in a sandy part. My front wheel just went off, slip, slipped off the course. There was a little bit of a kind of a thing going down, and yeah, it's a long race. We've been racing now many days in a in a row, and it's so easy to lose concentration a little bit. Luckily, it was like in a very safe spot, so nothing happened. How does it feel to keep winning every day here? <laughs> um, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Uh, like I just said, you have to maintain the concentration and the focus. Um, and when you're so tired the whole time, it's really that's really the real challenge. I mean, it's a big difference between like going for a two-hour ride, like well rested uh, on a course like today, and then going in, you know, fifth day in a row of racing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad we made it through, and <laughs> we're slowly starting to count down the days. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, our race leaders, Investec Songo, specialised on a, on a break, and, and uh, Anna, Annika Langwell there. It, it, it's taking its toll, but they chipped away today. Interesting to hear them say that they, uh, they deviated from that plan, didn't they, today? And perhaps that, that off was, was an example of it, going perhaps a little bit, the red mist a little bit too much there? Yeah, a little bit. I wonder if it's from overcooking it, making yeah. a mistake, or just letting down the guard a little bit, riding with less intensity, less concentration, then making a mistake, uh, uh, only they will know. But uh, the, the truth is that in the ABSA Cape Epic, if you don't make a mistake the whole way through, you haven't tried. Yep. And you could have gone much faster because uh, it's just on at every turn and sometimes even in the straight lines you make a mistake, you get caught up in the sand and down you go. And they could just be fortunate that uh, it was a very minor one. It's all about balancing your efforts at the, at the race and you don't take any risk, you don't get the rewards, and uh, sometimes, especially for the teams contending for the second and the third spot on the podium, 
with a huge buffer that uh, Investec Songo Specialized had. They can afford a little bit of it, a little bit of um, leeway here and there. But again, to take your eyes off the prize is, um, is sometimes a mistake, and that's when things can go wrong. So confirmation of the general classification of the women's race at the moment. 25 minutes and 28 seconds. The battle behind is going to be fascinating. Lutian Rostovska may come into their own on the longer stages now. Lil and Morale, very much cross-country riders. They would have loved today, and they did do very well. Just 144 behind Investix on Go Specialized. So they've opened up that lead now just over eight minutes over Lutian Rostovska. And eight minutes, as we've illustrated, uh, we've talked about over the uh, last couple of days, is just uh, two little mechanicals, two small mechanicals could be. And none of these teams have backup teams like no. in, the, in the men's category, so... This could make play a big role. Just uh, one twisted chain or a court chain or you know, obviously a puncture. We've seen many of those or a broken wheel or something like that. And uh, it could be a very long run down to the next tech zone. So the uh, day tomorrow brings us uh, real, real drama and excitement potentially because this is a transition day from Oak Valley here in Elgin Krabbo. And uh, they head around uh, the trails, the A to Z trails, legendary here in uh, Hrabo. And uh, then they make their way to an equally legendary section of the route. And that's the Hantu uh, Pass. After they've gone over that uh, dimension data hotspot, plenty of sharp teeth in tomorrow's stage. 100 k's, 2,850 meters of climbing. They've gone down the Hantu Pass. They make their way across the uh, Lawrenceford uh, Valley, the basin. And that's it now, around and up and uh, over the Helderberg Trails and towards Stellenbosch. Well, this may not be where the action happens, the, uh, the concrete strip section in the Dimension Data Hotspot. That might not be where the, no. the initial race uh, splits up, but it certainly will be a spot where Scott Stram Racing will want to soften up their rivals uh, for, the, uh, for, the sections, for the sections to come. This is a chess game, and it's all about the first move that counts but not necessarily until the end. It's uh, it's setting the the foundations for uh, for an o for a victory and uh, the overall victory too. Hantu Pass is a big marker, and all depends on how the legs cope with that. The cross country riders aren't used to running that far. The marathoners have had certain stages in their in their careers where they've had to run a bit, some portage. Um, but if the race is together at the King's Climb, that's where we really expect it to absolutely explode. But let's not underestimate the middle section between kilometer 50 and kilometer 65. That's where there's going to be a lot of action going to happen as well. Now the Land Rover Technical Terrain, you caught a glimpse of it there, the Helderberg Trails. They're familiar that it's a cross-country circuit there and a downhill course. And uh, I know that these riders, a lot of the pros would have been there and ridden that before. And the Wannabe Trails, Helderberg Trails, you head out into Stellenbosch and, well, they're just uh, a wealth of uh, trails there. They're only riding a fraction of them tomorrow, but they'll get to know them better as the uh, week unfolds. Because it's a huge network of trails there. and the riders come from all over the world, including uh, the top riders, uh, Nino Schota, uh, Avancini, uh, Manuel Fumich spends a lot of time in Cape Town. And uh, what I'm going to be looking out for at that, uh, that last water point, uh, there's the, the final water point is a hydro station, not a full water point, you could say, just a refuel. But uh, where are they going to put their, their hydration packs? That's the big question. <laughs> will they start with them and skip uh, the first hot spot, the first water point, or will they pick them up uh, a little later? That's going to be one of the uh, fascinating uh, stories that unfold tomorrow. There's so many. Well, there's so much that could happen. And seeing that Scherter and Furst are now in second, 1 minute 13 down, it's the first actual stage, because this one is a time trial, it's not a normal stage, the first stage where they aren't leading the race. They've, yeah. they've ridden somewhat defensively throughout the stage and then chosen their moment to go on the attack and win the stage, build a bit of a buffer. Now they're trying to get time back. Will they be content to wait late in the stage and maybe nip off another minute, minute and a half? Or do they want to go for the, the big bomb and, and go early and long? And we've also seen, you've got to take the opportunity when it comes to you. Yesterday's mechanical for Scott Stram provided the opportunity for Cannondale. And so they went long and they went all the way to the finish and took the jersey. So the race is going to throw us up something that we're just not expecting. Absolutely. That's the beauty of this uh, event, the untamed African mountain bike race, the unpredictability of it. It is uh, all manner of pitfalls and problems that can uh, get under a team over the next three days. Lara is down in the winner's circle with the Grandmasters.
Hello guys, how was it uh, this ride, 43 kilometers for today? Actually it was a pretty nice course, a lot of single track which was uh, very nice to ride and luckily the weather was nice as well. Uh, I think we had a good day, beginning was uh, a bit hard to, to warm up uh, because at, at all the hard stages, uh, especially from yesterday. So, uh, but uh, after half an hour, it went pretty well. Everyone says that the cruise was very nice. Is it possible to suffer, stay focused and enjoy at the same time? Yes, today is a funny day. Hey, hey, nice trails, hey, good this stage. For me, it's, it's nice. It's good that it's also very early still, so now you have time for recover properly for tomorrow? Yep. Well, uh, tomorrow it's green stage, uh, as I call it. It's uh, probably the hardest of this week. Uh, it's good to, uh, that we have a little bit more rest, uh, but still also like today, it's two hours uh, full speed, uh, high intensity, high heart rate, uh, and definitely we will need uh, this uh, extra rest this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bart Brenchens, Bart Brenchens, Sabra Azevedo, leaders of the Grand Masters. Uh, Bart is uh, the uh, ra ace racer, number one. I mean, that's all he does. He races absolutely flat box here every year. Well, I did see our Masters leaders, yep. uh, Hermida and Rodriguez, come in, but they haven't won the stage. Looking down through the list, it's... Eric Decker and Martin Schellinghi, the former Dutch road professionals, who rode four minutes faster than Hermida and Rodriguez. Decker and Schellinghi had a massive mechanical yesterday. Uh, Eric Decker, he, he's riding on the uh, electronic gears, ripped the cable completely out to the rear derailleur. So they had to put Schellinghi's bike next to it, use his cable to plug in, change it to the required gear. They made a single speed of Eric Decker's bike. And Brilliant. he rode one gear all the way through. Uh, they got to then uh, a hydro point where the mechanics were and they put on a mechanical shifter so you could then change gears from that point on. Lost a massive amount yeah. of time, but they said yesterday afternoon, we're back with a vengeance in the time trial. This is the one we're gunning for. And they've put four minutes into the leaders and uh, won themselves the stage. Well, they're down in the winner's circle. One half of the team is as we're waiting the presentation. Martin Chilingi is here waiting for Eric Decker uh, because he, Eric's uh, rode on and thought, well, we haven't won the stage. Maybe we have, but here they come. So we're going to perhaps hear from them in a little while. But we're just waiting for the uh, presentation of the stage winners, both the men and the women. As, uh, well, Eric Decker's not away. far off. He's, he's all the way along the finish route telling his yeah. story to anyone who will listen. He <laughs> loves it. He loves the story. I'm sure he's going to give us a great interview as well. It's too late because uh, let's go to the uh, to the, yes, the Dimension Data GC leaders are going to be interviewed now <laughs> because Eric's been a little bit uh, too, too late. Go to Laura. Hello, Laura. So the news are that today you didn't win. <laughs> so you have one day like this today. Yeah, great day. <laughs> great news, huh? Uh, well, uh, today we decided to take it a little bit easy, not losing too much time to the top guys. But uh, in any case, uh, 43k uh, today was really nice trail, really nice uh, time trail. But at the end, it was also tough, eh? tough climbs that uh, you need to push uh, hard. If not, uh, you have to walk on it. And uh, yeah, it seems that uh, we lost uh, time. But uh, for us, the most important is uh, the next day uh, to don't make mistakes, to don't have flat tires, technical problems, and then keep uh, the gap. Even if we lose, uh, we have to keep a little bit the gap, and that's it. For, for us, it's going to be the goal. As you are the official translator, how was for Purito? You know he didn't like much the time trials when he was a pro. When he was a professional, he didn't like the chronos, no? <laughs> he says uh, he didn't like uh, time trials uh, right now either, but uh, with those trails, uh, he was uh, most of the time in front, and he enjoyed uh, to open uh, to open the trail and to open the lines. Uh, so uh, uh, he's getting a time trial special. Maybe we see a comeback uh, in Tour de France in a couple of years. Good congratulations, anyway. Thank Thanks you. So see you, boys. Damage data race leaders, Burrito uh, and uh, Hamida Bat. They, they in fact finished third on the stage. Yeah. So Eric Decker and uh, Martin Chalingi won the stage. Second was uh, Andre Fojic and his partner Jose Silva, the Midas head new race team. But no panic for Hermida and Rod Rodriguez because in the overall, they're leading by 43 minutes. No sweat for them, and uh, yeah, that's what today was about. Burrito, not that happy, not sort of that comfortable on the single trail. So just happy to 
to tap it out. So uh, let's hear from our stage winners in the Dimension Data Masters, Chilingi and Deca. Well, new winners here in the master category. Eric, Martin, how was it for you today? It is awesome. This is what mountain biking, why I am here to be mountain biking. It's unbelievable. I mean, the track was amazing. Uh, we were good today. We, we got them, uh, I think, riding out here uh, out of the park. And uh, we could keep a really high pace today. And uh, yeah, we didn't see anybody uh, behind us. And we thought, OK, let's just keep on pushing till the end. And uh, yeah, we had good legs from the start to the finish. It was really nice. And do you think you are going to pay some effort tomorrow <laughs> with the Queen Estate? <laughs> well, I think in the Cape Epic you don't think about tomorrow. <laughs> no, every, every day actually we go, I think, full gas. Of, of course, today was a short stage at Town Top. But don't talk about tomorrow, please. We're just happy now that, that, that we won the stage. That, that, that's a little bit more than we expected. Uh, so we're really happy. Are you having fun here on the Apsagay Epic? Yeah, today was really fun, especially the biking. Yesterday we had a little less fun, but it was a story. I mean, we punctured in the first downhill and then we had the mechanical and then everything came after each other. St st standing still, so. Yeah, and so then you don't enjoy it that much, but I mean, it's, it's an amazing event and uh, look how many people are around here, uh, how many spectators, but also how many uh, people are enjoying the race also. And uh, I mean, it's, it's so much fun uh, to be here and, uh, and, and race but also and also the thrill of mountain biking today there were some spectacular downhills spectacular uphills also where you feel you have to go oh, you did deep. as well yeah uh, okay <laughs> because I, I have a lot of fun but during the race it's not fun like I mean it's hurting it's hurting a, it's hurting a lot and in the downhill I you really have to concentrate to stay on my bike because that's first priority uh, to stay together right? that's also something. Stay, yeah. stay together but it's, yeah. it's a really wonderful event yeah Amazing. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Eric Decker and Martin Chilingi, uh, lovely to hear their take on the Epsa Cape Epic. The, uh, they, they still got that racing instinct because they wanted to race and race hard and they won the stage today, but they're having a blast out there. They are absolutely, and uh, you just see the excitement in both their eyes and talking about today's course and how they really enjoyed the single track and they're just brilliant trails around here. And, uh, yeah, that's the, the message that's then going around the world with this coverage, the, the streaming of the, the Absa Cape Epic and then having all these international riders here, even those racing, but even people like me who get out for the odd ride, you go home and you tell the stories and talk about how great the riding is here and uh, that's certainly going to attract more international visitors in the future. Maybe not all to come and race, but certainly to come and ride the trails. Robbie, pick yourself a fellow countryman you would want to ride this race with. Well, I, I'd, I'd right. actually go with a very good mate of mine, a guy who we were on the, the team together for a number of years and, and helped me in, in a whole bunch of races and, and take race wins. And uh, always a good time to be around. And I don't think it punished me too much uh, is Nick Gates, okay. another, another Aussie uh, with the same age. Um, and I, I think that'd be a, an okay combination. Right, we just fill that entry in for If we, we were to do it, but you're still not going to convince me to go and race. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's signed up already. I believe that we've already got the race register going and you're number one. <laughs> Mr. Gates, you're just in. A, just ahead of Pino. <laughs> well, this is uh, further back down the field. These riders, all they're still rolling off for queues and queues of uh, teams heading off at literally 20 second uh, intervals. In fact, they're rolling off together. Gri uh, groups of uh, four riders, they're rolling off pretty much uh, together. So it's uh, all the fun of the fair here because it's a holiday today. There's a great vibe here, great weather. As you're talking about picking partners for the Cape Epic, yeah. I was talking to Oscar Freire yesterday and I said, so what was be behind the decision? How did you, you come to uh, ride in a mixed team? He said, well, he said, An absolutely no offence. It's not being derogatory in any way, but I chose to ride in a, a mixed team because I didn't want to ride with someone who was stronger than me. <laughs> okay. He said, because I'm not here for the suffering. Okay. And he's going quite well, Oscar. Yeah, him and his partner Natasha, they're, they're yeah. doing very well. And uh, they had a real crack at it yesterday. And Natasha's actually a, more a triathlete. So uh, we go really to the podium. It. Yeah. Uh, they did really nicely. So this is the uh, presentation of the stage winners and the uh, leaders' jerseys, which haven't changed today. Well, that'll be taking place very, very shortly as they make their way out there. Meanwhile, team's still coming in. Oops, he's uh, popped onto the wrong side of the course, this uh, rider, but don't worry, you're, you're home. You'll get a time. 
No faster time than 1 hour 38 minutes and 40 seconds by that pair. Nino Schurter and Lars Foster. And they've narrowed the gap on general classification to just a minute and 13 seconds behind Cannondale Factory Racing. And as ever in a time trial, uh, be it time trial or prologue, we have that team that puts its head up and says, we can do this thing, can't we, Neil? Well, we were very interested to see that there's a new podium every day. It yep. seems that uh, we've got Team 7C, CBZ Willier, that's Mayer and Katanea on the podium today with uh, the likes of Scott Sram, Mountain Bike Racing and Cannondale Factory Racing. Good performance for them. We expected a lot out of them in the beginning of the race. Uh, we'd seen them perform really well um, out in the world circuit and um, really it's good to see them uh, get to the podium and get some TV time for them, for themselves and for their sponsors and uh, actually get to hear what they say because uh, all eyes of the world will be on, um, on their comments in the interviews. So teams rolling in after their efforts there, around about two hours, two and a half hours. There's a four hour and 15 minute uh, maximum time allowance today for the time trial. And uh, so it should have pretty much everyone back by about 3.30 this afternoon, which uh, for even the slowest of teams means a little more time uh, to uh, recover and prepare for tomorrow's transitional day. It's a real treat today for the uh, for the riders, and this is even uh, the exact circuit today would be the circuit that I would come and ride on the weekend, yep. and uh, it's got its mix of everything, some open roads, and uh, the main focus is on the single track. So to our podium presentation in the UCI Elite Women's category, smiles uh, from Luti and Rostovska again, and uh, Adelaide Morat and Candice still both went really well today, those teams. Well, Lil and uh, Morat particularly so. So there we go, Crossspur in third place today. And they'll slowly chip away uh, at the deficit uh, from yesterday's issues, punctures and uh, picking up an incorrect tyre or already punctured tyre. Luti had a bad year last year. She had to retire from the race. Her partner, Gitmit Kiels, uh, fell ill showing today. And then um, South African Candice Lil and German Adele Morath. One spot up today. They were second yesterday, second again today. Looks really unlikely that the pair in the middle are going to get unseated from that position. There they go, the uh, World Road Race Champion on the left, the World Marathon Champion in the mountain bike on the right, and Anna van der and Anna Galangfell, a fifth stage win on the trot. Now looking impregnable at the moment, their lead is just superb, 23 minutes, and uh, that's our prologue result today. So, uh, Wojtlowska and Luti back on the podium after yesterday's difficult day. And the orange jersey certainly won't change uh, hands today. The racing has been uh, intense behind them. You heard them, they said they wanted to set out and take it fairly easy today and just uh, keep it safe. They did have one or two close calls. Uh, Annika went off the trail. Could have been worse if the trees hadn't have been there to catch her bike. It could have stood a long way down that, but uh, she uh, recovered well enough. It didn't cost them too much time. So f another stage win and another day in orange. They were five days in and they haven't put a foot wrong, really. If you look at the result sheet, the result sheet says it all. It's like a it's a pretty accurate prose as to what's been going on during the race. It's a pure show of dominance. They have been on the top step every single day, both receiving that uh, leader's jerseys, the zebra stripe jerseys from ASOS, and of course winning every single stage. Really look very dominant and uh, sends a message to their, com to, their, uh, to their rivals that really doesn't look like there's much they can do. I think, yeah, this pairing they rode two hours and two minutes and that time would have put them firmly in the top 50 in the men's division, would have had them in 47th. Well, there they go. Orange again for Investec Songo Specialized, Annika Langville and Anna van der Breggen. Langville, a four-time winner of the Absa Cape Epic, has yet to know what it's like not to win this event. And Anna van der Breggen has yet to know, uh, has yet not to win a stage. And every 
the stage she's written, she's won the stage. So uh, a pretty perfect record by that pair. Well, we saw last year with uh, Kate Courtney, Annika Langvall, who won almost all the stages except for the last one in Val de I wonder if this year she's thinking, I want the clean sweep. I think that that's what they're going to uh, look at for them uh, to, to win every single stage here. I think, uh, they didn't, they're, they're not the sort of uh, combination as we heard today after that uh, post ride interview. Uh, they're both racers, and when they get onto the, uh, when the gun goes, they want to race and they want to win. That's uh, why they're so successful. To the men's presentation, and the first appearance on the uh, podium. For the 7C CBZ Villier pair, Louis Mayer and Johnny Catano. Yeah, the Colombian and the uh, Italian having a great performance today. Really uh, looking to do it all week and uh, they've obviously picked today. They weren't one of the teams that were resting. They started off the day 10th overall, so they have been keeping it on the gas all the way through the Italian on the right hand side and the Colombian on the left. Good performance from them. Well, they had a lead uh, this morning of 2 minutes and 41 seconds. They still lead, but uh, second on the stage today. And uh, Ulrich Gavansini and Manuel Fumich smiling broadly. Smiling very broadly, putting on a, perhaps a brave face. They didn't expect to lose that much time. We heard in the interviews that they were a bit surprised. The uh, slight mechanical that they had, a broken lockout switch means they didn't have suspension. But all played into the hands of uh, Scott Sram. Putting the pressure down exactly where it counted. And uh, Nino Schurter and Lars Foster back on the top step again. Four out of five for these two. Not, not only rode the fastest time, but they looked like they had the most fun out there too. It was tail whips aplenty and really enjoying the course. It was uh, great to see the Euro and World Champion just uh, enjoying these trails so much. Uh, quite a collection there, world champion, Olympic champion, European champion, German champion, world marathon champion, Brazilian champion. They're all there and uh, they're all here at the Absa Cape Epic across the ages and uh, the disciplines. Camdell Factory Racing's uh, Manuel Fumich and Enrique Cavantini will be asked to stay behind because they've still got to collect those yellow jerseys. They won't be wearing their trade jerseys again. Going to be back in the yellow jersey. Well, certainly not tomorrow. They'll be wearing the yellow jersey tomorrow, their trade jersey. Well, that will be interesting. It'll be fascinating. We'll see the world champion and uh, the European champion in their respective jerseys tomorrow. And uh, they've got a minute and 13 to make up tomorrow. It'll be a fantastic tussle all the way to Stellenbosch. Will they want to do it tomorrow? You can bet that Nino Schurter won't hold back. So, the yellow jerseys. After five days of racing in the 2019 Absa Cape Epic. Ulrich Cavazzini and Manuel Fubik from Canada Factory Racing. They're very popular out here. They've got a, a great following. Regular visitors, as we've been saying, to South Africa. You bump into them uh, on the trails or the coffee shops around uh, Stellenbosch. This is a moment they're going to savour. They've been in the yellow jersey before. They've been in the yellow jersey really early on in the uh, in the race. In fact, on their first appearance together, and uh, as a partnership, Mandel Fumich has ridden with Marco Fatana, the uh, Olympic bronze medalist. In fact, he was the uh, at the time he was the Olympic bronze medalist, and um, he's definitely found a really great partner in the Brazilian, really cohesive unit, and uh, fantastic entire the entire team outfit. In fact. Yeah, they're on uh, song of the moment, Fumich and Avancini. They've got the rest of the day to uh, rest, recover, and uh, prepare for the Queen stage. Do you think they're wondering, Gerald, if they can hold on to their jersey? I think that's going through their mind. They know they it's, can. It's all positive, all positive thoughts from this point. So, a quick look at our general classification. This is the women's going into stage five. Lil and Morath. Uh, 25 28 back but eight minutes behind them Lutian Rostovska uh, back in the hunt and uh, Ralph and Hill the only uh, all African team inside the top seven and Sonia Looney and uh, Catherine Williamson a combination having an absolute blast out there a long way back Catherine Williamson a former winner of this uh, race but uh, taking it a lot more relaxed this year 
to our men's classification. How tight is this? A minute and 13. Sure, turn faster behind Fumic and Avancini of Canada Factory Racing Ferrara and Poro have leapfrogged Uber and Steve John into uh, third place. But again, that is another battle that's going to rage certainly tomorrow. Likewise, fifth and sixth, Hathalie and Beers starting to eat their way closer to the top five. Yeah, a lot of battles, races within the race. Fantastic to see. So tight at the top, but second, uh, second and third, uh, sorry, third and fourth, and then fifth and sixth as well. Uh, it's going to be Really interesting to watch all those battles play out over the next couple of days, particularly tomorrow's big, bad five-star stage. Huge day, transition day tomorrow, Neil, um, and just a minute and 13 between uh, those top two. How do you see it? Where do you see the key moment tomorrow? The key moment is the entire race, actually, because we've got, uh, we've got such a variety. We've got really steep climbs in the beginning, uh, right up to the Dimension Data hotspot. We've got a water point where everything might regroup, but there'll be some soft legs after that. Uh, we've got the uh, portage section, which is unusual for, um, for the cross-country races. And then towards the end of the race, at about the 65-kilometer mark, things will really start to light up. Anything, any mistakes that were made early on that had to be made up for catching up, that's where it's really going to count. And if it's all together on the King's Climb, it'll explode. It's the last 35 kilometers that really look to be the place that it will and should happen. But when opportunity knocks, you've got to open the door and go with it. Absolutely. It's rough tomorrow. The ter terrain is very different to today. Equipment will be put to the test. Support teams may come into play tomorrow again, as we saw yesterday. Uh, it's one of those days that is going to uh, be remembered for a long, long time. It's one of the toughest of the Absa Cape Epic. And there's still more to come in uh, Stellenbosch uh, over the next couple of days. So it's going to be all the way down there. And the women's race... You cannot look beyond Investec Songo Specialized heading towards, again, home territory if you like. The uh, Specialized team have their base in Stellenbosch, uh, that they are going to put it, uh, put the rest of the teams to the sword again tomorrow. But Candestill and Adelaide Morath have done extremely well today. They've kept themselves in the frame there in second place, and they're going to feel the heat from Cross Spur behind them. Behind us, you'll see riders coming in now. Uh, at the finish here and riders heading out so all the way through this afternoon there are riders out on this uh, prologue course uh, getting uh, their legs a, a bit of a run out today it's going to be tough four hours for some of them we just saw Oscar Ferrer arrive with Oscar his partner Sally. and uh, no doubt be looking to see what uh, what they say hopefully they enjoyed uh, their day out in the Western Cape and the, the Elgin Crabeau area with all the uh, famous single track in fact some of the best single track in the world right Robbie well, it's going to be a huge day tomorrow. Everybody is thinking, whoever's in, recovery mode and get ready for tomorrow. All right, Robbie's doing a big, he's got lots of time now for a big well, yeah, ride tomorrow. I've got to find somewhere else to ride those. Any recommendations, send them through. I need to find a trail that uh, these guys aren't on. What I, uh, the Huntu Pass is probably what we need to recce. I think you need to run Thanks up and down Thanks very much. I think times. we can wrap it right here. <laughs> <laughs> he's got to go. Thank you for joining us here. It's been a great uh, morning. I hope you've enjoyed the drama and excitement of the prologue at the Epic in 2019. It is uh, full of intrigue and excitement as the race heads towards its grand finale at beautiful Val de Vie on Sunday. But so much between then, uh, between now and then can uh, change. You know where to catch us tomorrow morning. Promise all, Neil, Robbie, myself and Laura out on the field. Cheers until tomorrow.